Ottawa. CIWW 1310 AM Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM Smith Falls and the Valley. City News Time 9 o'clock. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, August 20th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now under a heat warning in Ottawa, 20 degrees, 21 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. This hot, sticky weather we are in expected to last to the start of next week. Environment Canada says we are under a heat warning. City News meteorologist Jill Taylor says people with underlying health conditions have to be extra cautious, but this kind of heat can affect everyone. Watch for the effects of heat illness, swelling, rash, cramps, fainting, heat exhaustion. It can really catch up on you quite quickly. Stay hydrated, take breaks if you have to work outdoors, and really reduce your outdoor activity if you can. Now, Jill says this huge dome of heat over eastern Ontario will continue into the start of next week, possibly right into Wednesday. Expecting high temperatures through the weekend into the start of the week to be in the low 30s, feeling like the low 40s. One man seriously injured in an overnight single vehicle crash. This happened near Dow's Lake on the Queen Elizabeth driveway. A 20-year-old man rushed to hospital in critical condition, but police have not released any further details on the crash. Queen Elizabeth remains closed from Preston to Crescent Heights. Uh, City News will keep you updated on the condition. At last word, that man may be in stable condition. City News Time, 901 Let's get the latest forecast now with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Hot and humid conditions today right through the weekend. Heat warning continues. We've got some fog this morning. Otherwise, sun and cloud. The high 33 will feel like 41, 21 for the low. Highs on the weekend, 30 to about 32, feeling closer to 42. And just a slight chance of some wet weather. For today, the high 33. And right now, feeling like 28. It's 20 degrees in Ottawa, 21 in Smiths Falls. The United States is extending the restriction on non-essential tra- essential travel at land and ferry border crossings until September 21st now. U.S. Department of Homeland Security said in a tweet the measures are kept in effect to reduce the spread of COVID-19, including the Delta variant. It says it will keep ensuring the flow of essential trade and travel. Restrictions have been in place since March of 2020. They were set to expire Saturday, but again moved to at least September 21st. Nearly a week after the fall of Kabul, the effort to rescue Canadians and Afghan supporters from the Taliban-controlled capital appears to be ramping up. At least one of the two military transport planes was in Kabul overnight, one of the Canadian ones. It may have already returned to Kuwait. The military not yet confirming it, but one flight tracker seems to indicate it. According to the Globe and Mail, several Afghan allies living in safe houses in the capital received texts from Canadian immigration officials late Thursday telling them to head to the airport. If so, this would be the first Canadian military flight out of the capital since the Taliban seized full control of the city late Sunday. Canada's Defense Department Department says the two cargo jets it will use in the evacuations have now been modified as well to carry as many people as possible and that could include some other foreign nationals as some Canadians uh, may be on other countries flights part of a new NATO agreement to expedite the process in in Kabul Canada and some other countries are now doing most of the vetting of passengers uh, outside of Afghanistan third-party countries from Alex Bloomfield 680 news time 830 And I'm Andrew Boyle for news anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's got the news and the views. He's got views on the news. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Ah, Friday. We made it to another day of 100% humidity, humid X readings in the low 40s, and very little wind. And just on that note, I want to point out again this morning, here it is, it's going to be one of the hottest days of the summer. And electricity demand is going to be very high today. It's going to peak, the IESO says. The IESO operates the electricity grid in Ontario. And it says electricity demand is going to peak 
at 6 o'clock this evening, if fans worrying air conditioners going full blast, appliances being used to make supper for the kids, you get the idea. And at 6 o'clock, electricity demand in Ontario will peak at almost 23,000 megawatts, which is pretty much all the electricity that Ontario can pump out in any given hour. And yet, as of right now, on what will be one of the hottest, stickiest, sweatiest days of the summer, as of right now, the wind turbines of Ontario, built at great taxpayer expense, are producing, are you ready for this? Zero point nine two percent of Ontario's electricity. 0.92%. Or put another way, 99.08% of Ontario electricity is coming from something other than the wind farms of Ontario area. And as for solar farms on a hot sunny day in the summer, the province's solar farms, what a crop this is, bumper crop. There's seven of them across Ontario. They are supplying to the grid an incredible 0.013% of Ontario's electricity right now. So all of the solar farms and all of the wind farms, there are 45 wind farms in Ontario Combined, right now, they are producing less than 1% of what the province needs on one of the hottest days of the year. And just one more quick note. This is all government data updated hourly and all publicly available. You can look it up yourself. I'm not making this up. We have, you know, and we have all kinds of politicians. Oh, build back better, build back better. We have to build back better. Green, 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 green touting all the wonderful benefits of renewable energy. There is a wind farm. It is called the K2 wind farm. It's not far from a place called Goderich, Ontario. Not far from the Bruce nuclear power plant. 30 minute drive from the Bruce nuclear power plant. The K2 wind farm is one of the largest wind farms in the entire country. They claim, the owners claim, it can produce enough electricity to power 100,000 homes. Well, you know how much electricity it is making right now on one of the hottest days of the year when electricity demand might be the highest of the entire year? You know how much electricity it's producing right now? Zero. Zero. 140 windmills and a hamster wheel would generate more electricity. Look, I have said it before and I'll say it again. On a day like today, if we had to rely on this wind power and solar power with 40 degree humid X readings, people would die. Old people like Lowell Green would die. They wouldn't find him and Deb in the coop to carp. They wouldn't find their bodies for days. So to all of you, the McGinty Liberals, the Wynn Liberals, the Smitherman Liberals, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Job well done. Congratulations. Great plan there. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Look, Friday morning, a few hours from the weekend. Look at me, I'm all worked up. <laughs> great. We have a great show for you this morning. The legendary Lowell Green is coming right up. If he's still alive. It's been, <laughs> it's been a few weeks since I've had a chance to pick the brain of the big guy. Bork is back. Pierre Bork, Bork News Watch. We'll go over a week's worth of headlines. Talk some sports. We haven't talked sports yet this week. Steve Warren will join us. Steve Warren Project. We're going to talk about football. Red Blacks playing tomorrow night against the Rough Riders. Elliot Finkelman is on our show this morning. I've known Elliot for 20 years. 
haven't talked to him in a while. We worked together in the radio business for a long time. He is in the cruise line business. He books cruises through Expedia Cruises, Ottawa, Canada, Westboro Parliament. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. The cruise business. Parts of calling a fourth wave. Do the Queen's Park Weekend Review with our MPPs. Should be a hot one today, given all the news about mandatory vaccine policies. Not necessarily mandatory vaccines from the Ford government. And Jenna Suds, city councillor, now running for the Liberals in Kanata Carleton, my guest at 9.45 this morning. Kanata Carleton is, for my money, along with Ottawa Centre, uh, is one of the ridings to watch on election night. And she hopes to make the leap from city councillor to member of parliament. Again, 9.45 this morning. And as always, you're in the middle of it all during the talk back hour. Do that every morning between 10 and 11 o'clock, an hour of phone calls, an hour of opinions, hottest hour of talk radio in town. And today, it's the Friday free-for-all. So we're up for talking about just about anything. It's wide open, right? During the Friday free-for-all, we don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. We leave the heavy lifting up to you. I always have something to say. You know that. But I always want you to have your say. That's why we do the talk back hour at 750-1310, 750-1310, 613 I mean, the election's the big story. First week of the election campaign. Uh, I'd be curious to know how you would answer this question. Who won the week? Who won the week? I don't think it was the liberals. I have to tell you. I have not been impressed with the start of the Liberal campaign at all. I think it's been uh, scattered. I think it's been sloppy. I think at times it's come across as uh, flaky and arrogant and certainly desperate at times. Desperate. I mean, abortion. Abortion. Really? After the year and a half everyone has been through and all the issues that have been raised because of the pandemic in the last year and a half, you want to talk about abortion? You're playing the abortion card barely a week into the campaign? Reeks of desperation. It's really pathetic and sad to see, actually. And they're not even telling the truth about the issue. They're lying through their teeth. The Liberals have had a bad week because they haven't offered Canadians, to this point, a compelling reason why we're even in the election. They don't have a platform. Afghanistan is a catastrophe that is unfolding by the minute on the cable news networks and all over social media. They tried to make vaccine mandates a wedge issue. It backfired on them because O'Toole's policy was the same policy the Treasury Board was working on already. And the prime minister came across as totally aloof and out of touch on the biggest issue right now, which is not abortion. It's the cost of living. And he totally flubbed the answer about inflation in the Bank of Canada. So to me, I, the, the liberals had a bad week. They did not win the week. I think the conservatives and the NDP had a much better week than, than the liberals. I'll be right up front with you. I had no confidence as a right of center guy, no confidence at all in the conservative campaign that they would be able to, to run a disciplined, mature, you know, grown up campaign. And then the Willy Wonka ad came out and it just confirmed my early suspicions. Oh, cheapers, creepers, what are you doing over there? But by the end of the week, I think you can say they had a good week overall. I thought O'Toole handled the abortion question just fine. There's no confusion about where he stands on that issue, hasn't shied away from it. I think he's done a great job talking about cost of living issues, housing affordability issues. Now, uh, what I'd like to see him do is pivot into health care. The conservatives have a compelling offer to the provinces on health care. And as we saw with the Nova Scotia shock election outcome, health care is a big issue. It registers not just with people in Nova Scotia, every Canadian. Health care is an issue. It's there for the taking, in my opinion. So I hope to get your thoughts on the election this morning. Who won the week?
And we can talk about all sorts of other things as well, because that's how we roll on a Friday morning on the Rob Snow Show on City News. So the birth of Absinthe was uh, 2002, I think, 2003, and I was working at Urban Bistro um, happily, uh, where uh, Allium is now. Uh, and then uh, this space where Holland Cafe was, uh, came up, it's on the corner of Spencer and Holland. And uh, I spoke to the landlord and there's a lot of interest from a lot of other people, but he and I just, you know, got along super well and he, put a lot of faith in me. So uh, Carmen Turner is his name. He, uh, he gave me the lease to the place and, and really pretty much gave me all the equipment in the place. So I was really lucky. I've been really lucky with landlords that way, actually both my current landlord and Carmen Turner. Um, Cause if there hadn't been Carmen Turner, there wouldn't have been Absinthe. So we were there for a few years uh, and just sort of outgrew the place. And then now we're here. It's obviously been tough and it's been tough for everyone. I mean, that's the, you know, for it's the, been the big democratic sweep of like in restaurants and the hospitality and the arts that we were talking about earlier. It's like everybody's been impacted pretty much the same um, from everybody that I talked to. We're down 80, 75, 80 percent. We're, and we're climbing out now. Um, I think the one of the saddest things is, is like we like everybody, we went down to two employees from 25 um, and we're now at four and we're bringing two new people on this week. So we'll be at six. So it's, you know, little steps. So it's been tough. It's, you know, um, I've got the most expensive uh, clubhouse ever here because some days you come and you don't do any business, but you're here. But I'm, I'm grateful for what I do have. I think everybody's optimistic now, um, n not necessarily just about the vaccine, but about like the, the vaccine, spring, being able to be outside. I think you're going to see a lot of like pop-up things happen in parking lots and on sidewalks and all. Then like that, rather than being actually inside somebody's commerce, I think we'd like to take it outside. Um, I know my staff would. My staff like the outdoors now all of a sudden, you know, all four of us, um, six soon. Uh, but um, we'll, we'll be doing stuff, some business in the patio in the parking lot and we have a patio up front and I think other and I hope other restaurants and stores will do the same I hope that they take advantage of like the sidewalk and doing sort of you know uh, guerrilla marketing and stuff like that and really shaking it up a bit you can find us at Absinthe Cafe at 1208 Wellington Street West in Hindenburg and you can find us online at absinthecafe.ca The opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Good morning, Lowell Green. So how long am I going to live, Rob, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, fingers crossed you make it to Wednesday, I guess. I almost week. fell off my chair when I heard that. So if we only had wind power available, uh, Debbie and I, it's curtains, right? Curtains, <laughs> curtains, yeah. In the dark, in the dark. I, I agree with you. That there's simply no question that, uh, that O'Toole has performed very well, certainly superior, uh, much better than, uh, than Trudeau. It's been a disaster week for, for Trudeau. He, he, he Look, Trudeau looks confused. I, well, maybe it's because he is confused. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's just one disaster after another. But I'll tell you, uh, Singh wins one thing, best dressed. Man, oh, man, how much does he pay for those suits? It's unbelievable. Yeah. If, it, if this were a best dressed contestant, <clears throat> he would win it hands down. It's unbelievable. He's a sharp dressed man. Now, um, <laughs> It doesn't surprise me. I mean, there's very little wind today, so as a consequence, there's, there's almost no power being generated. But you're right. I mean, we spent how many billion? I mean, we will never, Rob, uh, you probably better than anybody else in this province has a, 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 the best understanding of, of exactly what happened with green energy here and the cost. But I don't think any of us will ever understand or ever be able to find out exactly how much the windmills and solar panels cost us and continue to cost us. I mean, it's in the 
tens of billions of dollars. And as you point out, on this day when we need it the most, producing virtually nothing. Wind and solar today, and I, I just checked, I double checked on you, and you're right. A combined wind and solar right now in Ontario producing less than 1% of our requirement. I mean, I know, it's astonishing. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, I know. it's almost enough to make you laugh. Look, no. So I just have to mention this as well because people still bring this broadcast. Uh, if I bump into people in Ottawa, you um, you know, they, they remember a broadcast you and me did with uh, Yasser Nakvi way oh, yes. back in the day. We were on a program called The Lunch Bunch. Yes. And he was our guest. We were hammering away at, at him over the um, Green Energy Bill or whatever, Green Energy Act or whatever it was called at the time. And we were saying, why aren't you importing, make the investment, try to strike an agreement with Quebec. Quebec has all kinds of clean hydroelectric power. Why, you know, why aren't you making an, he said, oh no, we couldn't do it. We couldn't, we couldn't be, ever be beholden to another province, especially one that threatens to separate. So well, uh, me, in my Globe just, and, just hold on a little. Yeah. In the Globe and Mail today, there's a little insert here. Ontario's glow, growing climate crisis, it said, g- gas plant pollution to increase by more than 300%. And it's from a group called uh, OntarioClimateAction.ca. Right. And it says, we don't need to import fracked gas from Western Canada and Pennsylvania to keep our lights on. We can lower our electricity bills and our climate impact by importing clean water power from Quebec. Well, welcome to the party. You're about 12, <laughs> 12 years behind schedule. Well, let me just back up a little bit. Yeah, Actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened was uh, I got a, <clears throat> excuse me, a phone call from a member of the Quebec Hydro Board. Uh, he, I, I can't tell you his name, although I still remember it clearly. And he said, Lowell, I just want you to know that Quebec Hydro is quite prepared and quite able to supply almost all of the electrical energy you need, certainly in eastern Ontario. Um, and I said, well, why are you telling me you should be t- telling the, the Liberal government? He said, we've contacted the Liberal government. We've told them it's available at a rate about half of what you are now paying. Least, they yeah. aren't interested. No. Maybe you can get your listeners interested. So that was what I, what I, I, I you, both you and I were talking to. And what was it? What's his name again? Yes, or Nackvi. Yeah. Yes, yeah, or yeah. Nack, I never remember his name. Yeah, he's running for and, the Liberals in Ottawa yeah, Centre so right I, now. I mean, we told him, and listen, Quebec Hydro has offered to, to supply... Uh, almost all of the power we need, certainly for eastern Ontario. And he said, yeah, you're quite right. His response was, well, we couldn't sign a deal with a, with a province that might separate. I want to point out that the, that the hydro lines already exist. If you come in from east, the eastern part of Ontario, uh, about Cumberland, there are all sorts of hydro lines crossing the Ottawa River. They're coming from a Quebec substation, just the other side of Gatineau, and coming in across at Cumberland. And that, there, there is sufficient capacity on those lines to power all of Ottawa Ottawa, and in fact, most of eastern Ontario, the power, the, the lines already exist. In fact, within a, a week or so, even today, Quebec Hydro could supply all of the power that we need. And by the way, they do supply the power to Cornwall, which has rates, hydro rates, about half of what we're paying. But anyway... That's that's yesterday, but I'm I'm interested to see that suddenly this the Globe and Mail is is, is woken to the fact that that yeah they could supply not only supply much cleaner much cleaner power, but um, but at about half the rate. Oh yeah, cheap. Yeah, cheap. It's very hydro is very cheap in Quebec. Um, I'll, I'll, you were quite right to identify the cost of living as a major issue here, but I'm going to tell you there is another issue that is brewing, that I think is going to come back if it hasn't already to haunt uh, Justin Trudeau. I think there, that he's got to be very careful. There's going to be blood on his hands. Uh, there is a, I, I'm uh, taking issue with a news story that you had just a few moments ago. I'm quoting right now, quote, word for word, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau said today it's going to be almost impossible to bring most of the Afghans who worked with Canada's military mission to safety, along with their families, because the Taliban is blocking the effort. So, so this this is this is unbelievable. I mean, we have known now for weeks, in fact, for months. It was back in April that Biden announced American troops were withdrawing. We should have had our people out of there long ago. 
And now we, they're saying, well, we have a couple of flights coming in from Kuwait. The problem is, is that uh, who, who, you know, is going to leave their, their safe hiding in their home someplace in Kabul they, and get out onto the streets. The Taliban is out there going door to door trying to find these people. They, they consider people who work with us as treasonous. They're not going to let them go. They're screening people on their way to the airport. They're screening people at the airport. And finally, Trudeau has admitted, quote, it's almost impossible to bring most of the Afghans. Now, we know that there are about 1,500 interpreters and about 5,000 members of the family. So now we're looking at, you know, close to 7,000 people alone, and the bulk of whom we have turned our backs on. We have abandoned. Yeah, yeah. We should have had them out weeks ago, yeah, for God's sake. It's a catastrophe. Sake. It's a catastrophe. You know what? If one and of those people is murdered, I think that the, I think that Trudeau has got to be held responsible. He he fiddled and fooled around with this God blessed election. That's all he's been concerned about is the freaking election. While people over in Afghanistan who helped us, who we promised, we promised those people we would look after them. That was the deal. You work with us. You interpret. You drive our car, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We will look after you. We will guarantee your safety. We are. We lied to them. We're not doing. It. In fact, we are abandoning them to the Taliban yeah, wolves. Yeah, Shame yeah, on us yeah, all. Yeah, Shame yeah. on us all. Yeah, the pri- you know the prime minister can't give his full attention to the matter. Obviously, uh, none of the ministers can. Well, you what know, the hell is he know, thinking about? Yeah, Apparently, um, he doesn't think about monetary mo- policy. So, what the hell is he thinking about? He's certainly not thinking about our obligation. We have an obligation to these people. We promise yeah, these people yeah. they work for us. Damn it all. This is not the Canadian way. You know, we don't leave people behind. But very clearly, if you're Afghanistan's, uh, Afghanis and you work with us, uh, well, we'll leave you behind. Sorry. And, of course, we're going to blame the Taliban. Well, of course, I mean, of course. Well, we, how long have we known that the Taliban are advancing rapidly? For God's sake. It's, uh, it's disgraceful. It's, you know what? Every, every liberal that supports us should hang their head in shame. Oh, okay. man. I, um, just, so uh, I, I want to ask you one more thing before we uh, wrap sure. things up here. Let me cool uh, down here. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it's, what, six days of the election campaign, and they're already talking about abortion on the liberal yeah. side. <laughs> Desperation. Desperation. The hidden agenda. The hidden You're agenda. You're right. You're, yeah. You identified that very quickly. This, they, they must be panicking. If they're bringing out the old, oh, we're going to scare the hell out of you with the abortion issue. Yeah. If they bring it out in the first week of the election, what do I mean? What have they got left to what try to scare left? us yeah. with? My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. One of the pollsters pointed out, when it comes to this whole idea, the hidden agenda, it's actually more Canadians believe now that the liberals have a hidden agenda more than conservatives. Like I ten, disagree ten, 100%. Ten points more. I don't think the liberals have any agenda. <laughs> no, but they, you know, lots of people, uh, yeah, they call my I, show all the time. Oh, the Great Reset, Rob. He's doing the Great Reset. Well, you know, global <laughs> government and all the tinfoil but, you know, but, but what is what is the platform? All I have seen from the from the liberal commercials so far is, you know, is, you know, we're, we look at the great job we have done with the vaccines. Essentially, they're 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 running uh, strictly on their record. But here here comes uh, O'Toole with a very very comprehensive full platform, fully announced right at the outset, uh, which we can debate, agree, or disagree with. And and what do we get from the liberals? Well, look at how great we are. Uh, not what we're going to do or what our plan is or anything else. Uh, I mean, aside from, from the green energy, what, what exactly do the liberals plan to do? They say they're going to have this great reset. Well, what the hell does that mean? Uh, very clearly, it doesn't, has got nothing to do with monetary policy, got nothing to do with the, with the cost of living. That's Oh, my goodness. Between the cost of living and uh, the situation in Afghanistan, look out. If I'm going to tell you, if, if, this, if they start shedding more blood because already people have been killed in Afghanistan. Whoa, what's that? I don't know. I think, uh, I, I don't know what happened there, but uh, we'll let you go, Lowell. Starting to break up there, okay? Uh, we're starting to break up. Uh, yep. Very clearly, the windmills have even stopped. There you go. The, there uh, you go. Point zero, 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 Seek zero, shelter, four, my percent. friend. Seek shelter. Seek shelter. We'll talk to you next week. That's the legendary Bye-bye. Lowell Green. Bye-bye. Uh, Bork is back yeah, after the news. Pierre Bork from Bork News Watch on City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, August 20th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, under a heat warning, it feels like 28, 22 degrees in Ottawa and Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. A heat dome over the entire region leading to a heat warning from Environment Canada and a warning that these scorching temperatures will be with us over the next few days. City News meteorologist Joel Taylor says with temperatures at or over 30, the Humidex will feel at or over 40, at least until Tuesday. Conditions forecast to be in place for that time and possibly into Wednesday. United States extending restrictions on non-essential travel at land and ferry border crossings until September 21st now. Restrictions which have been in place since March of last year were set to expire on Saturday. According to one flight tracker, the first of the Canadian military flights getting people out of Afghanistan has apparently taken off from the Afghan capital to Kuwait. We are hearing those who are taken from Afghanistan will be vetted once they're in a third country before being brought to Canada. One man seriously hurt in an overnight single vehicle crash. It happened near Dow's Lake on the Queen Elizabeth driveway. A 20-year-old man rushed to hospital in critical condition. According to EMS, it's believed that person has been upgraded to stable. City News Time 932. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Bork is back. Pierre Bork from Bork News Watch. Good morning. Rob, good morning and congratulations, my friend. Oh, thank you very much. I'm a very lucky man. I am a very lucky man. Yeah. And so is Jennifer. So good on you both. Um, you know, I'm just listening to the news here and some somebody had an accident on on Queen Elizabeth Drive at Dow's Lake, and I'm think I drove it yesterday, and I'm thinking to myself, how the heck do you have an accident there at, on Queen Elizabeth Drive at Dow's Lake? And the other thing that came to mind was there's this giant pedestrian crossway uh, not too far from the pavilion itself, but it's elevated, and maybe at night, if you're not paying attention, that thing launches you. I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. I haven't been on the uh, the, the driveway in a long time, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, can't speak wild. to that. Can't speak to just that. Wild. But it's one of the prettiest drives in Ottawa, that's for sure. Spectacular. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Uh, so let me ask you about the federal election campaign. Um, who won the week? <laughs> I, I wonder who won the week. I think the media won the week. The media? Uh, okay. The media won the week because there's lots to gnaw over, even if the, uh, if uh, much of the population is not necessarily woken up to the fact that we're into an election. Uh, Lowell mentioned J- Jagmeet Singh Suits. Yeah, he's a, he's a dapper man. I used to think of the dapper Don, the former senator, who got the boot uh, for other reasons. But uh, oh, Jagmeet, Don Meredith, yeah, Don yeah, Meredith. Don Meredith. Yeah. But uh, but Jugmeet loves uh, loves the clothes, and uh, he's a stylish guy. Look, he is. Oh, he's a styling guy. This. Yeah, yeah. I yep. think he's the Trudeau of this election, and rather than selfie sticks, he's got TikTok and what have you, and uh, he is catering and uh, and I won't say pandering, but not too far from that to that population, and it may pay off. Who knows? Um, who knows? Uh, Trudeau stumbling a little bit. Yeah, okay. Who cares about monetary policy, right? <laughs> and uh, you had you had uh, a field day with that one yesterday, Rob. I certainly enjoyed it. And then Aaron O'Toole finally getting out of the lazy boy, putting aside the popcorn, the potato chips. Yeah, it's good to get and- out of the West. And uh, th- there was no, um, you can't create a buzz if you're sitting like in a hotel conference room or whatever, wherever he yeah, was. Yeah, it, it's the know? craziest. It's the craziest yeah. uh, start to an election campaign since. Uh, um, uh, Michael Ignatieff took off on election day and got a flat on his bus <laughs> on his way to Cornwall. And you know how do you how do you garner uh, how do you show leadership? How do you get your troops going? How do you motivate the electorate if you're just sitting there and you know the, okay the I'm sure the room service at the Westin is fantastic, oh, but sure. that's not yeah. where the votes are. No, no. And in fact, if Trudeau isn't sharp, I was thinking about this driving in this morning. If Trudeau isn't sharp, it. it, it Usually, and and especially in advance of elections, he likes typically to get out. He does these tours, you know. He goes um, and does the thing, uh, the you know, the round table with the crowds, and um, he's got the sleeves rolled up, and uh, you know, the tie is loosened, and he's taking questions. 
from the crowd. And some, you know, so, you know, some of those events have gone better than others. Uh, but I've been told that he 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 likes to use those as kind of a warm up, you know, because you don't you never know what the person is going to ask. We assume you, the, the questions aren't vetty. You never know what the person's going to ask. Uh, they might be hard on you. They, they might take it easy on you. They might love you. They might hate you. Uh, but he views that as kind of a warm up, you know, to the campaign and especially the debates. And if he's not sharp right now, I wonder the inability not to get out there and glad hand and be in a big crowd of people and hear from them and take their questions, uh, hear their beefs and whatever. Um, I wonder if, if, if that has made him a little rusty. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think that's a natural environment for him in yeah, much yeah, yeah, the same yeah. way that it is for Jugmeet Singh. And, uh, you know, like if you go to a hockey game, they're going to warm up before the game starts. And uh, he's been rusty, uh, and uh, now he's getting back into it. I think a lot of those town halls have, uh, you know, chosen people who are sitting there to ask the questions. And you're going to get a lot of lob balls rather than some fastballs. But when you arrive in a place like Coburg, better to get that done earlier than later and, and, uh, and address whoever you're going to be addressing on the other side there that that didn't necessarily go as good as it could but that's in the past now and maybe they've got some good clips that they're going to bring back uh, at some point during the campaign uh, i really i really don't think i think that's his element though i really think that's he's in his element when he's in a in the crowds like that he's certainly crisscrossing the country um, at the same time that Aaron O'Toole seems to be crisscrossing Ottawa, he's crisscrossing yeah. the country. Uh, and, you know, uh, to heck with the climate, right? Let's fire up the jet and let's get going. Okay. But has he, and have the Liberals, have they adequately outlined to Canadians why we're having the election? Um, you know, if you keep it simple... Yeah. You keep it short and sweet. I think that's where they're sticking to. They're yeah. not. They, they're going to have various policy uh, uh, comments as they go along, but they're keeping it short and sweet. This is your chance to uh, react to everything we've done the, during the pandemic and just prior to that. And uh, we're ready for it, and we've called it. And it's poli- political expediency, especially if you believe what everybody seems to be pointing to, which is that uh, COVID rates are going back up everywhere. This fourth wave, the variants. Uh, the Delta variant and whatever else is coming next. Look at, there are hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people who are not yet vaccinated around the world. God knows what kind of variants are coming next after the Delta variant. So let's get this done now. And I think that's the way they thought about it. Here's our little window. Let's call it short and sweet. Let's do it. Let's keep it simple. You like what we're doing? Go for go it. For it. Try, yeah, go for it and try to get it over with. And if we win, we win big. Uh, if yep. we, you know, yeah, okay. And, and maybe maybe at worst we're back, we're back right where we started. No, I was just, just going to say, I don't think they're going to win big. You don't think I really think win, that yeah. those that uh, support him are going to be are going to support him. Those that don't are going to be uh, are going to be split between the NDP and the Conservatives, and we're back to where we began. But at least the, the electorate had was, was able to blow some steam and go and vote, and hopefully that doesn't they don't become super spreaders. All these. Uh, but do you see some polls. kind of big upset like the Nova Scotia election, like a big come from behind win in the works? I, I really don't think so. No, unless unless yeah. some major gaffe. Uh, happens, but look, we, we I think Trudeau by now is a known quantity. We know his gas. Uh, yeah. Is he going to come up with another one? Yeah. That's well, well, be well what would be bigger? What would be bigger than blackface? Yeah. That was what I was right. thinking. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I don't think the other the opposition, unless somehow you know, the, and I think this works against Trudeau and the Liberals is that Jugmeet is popular. Jugmeet is out there. He is working his magic, whatever that is. So he's going to bleed off, and we've had headlines about that this week at Bork.com, that he's going to bleed off uh, left-leaning Liberals who may be, you know, millennials who are dissatisfied with Trudeau. They feel that, as we've got on our site today, he'll say, Trudeau will say just about anything to get elected. Doesn't matter how nonsensical it is. Uh, Doesn't matter how much follow-through, how much transparency how much of anything is going to matter as long as you can say it and hope that you'll go his way. So he's going to bleed off that, and that's going to be to the Liberals' detriment. And unfortunately for the Conservatives, they just don't have that strength in leadership. They don't have it. So they're not going to pull. You know, They're not going to pull away uh, too many people on the right. Yeah, and I think for Aaron O'Toole and the Conservative, it has to be frustrating to see uh, the People's Party is consistently there between three and four percent. I mean, that's three and four percent you'd love to have, right? 
So. I think he'd love to have it. Absolutely, he'd yeah. love to have it. So Mad Max is out there. He'll be doing his stuff. We haven't heard too much from Mad Max yet. Uh, so let's see what happens with that. Will he be in the debate? Uh, will well, if he Anime keeps polling Paul, like that, he might be in the debate. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Will yeah. Anime Paul pull from the Liberals? Uh, I think if, uh, if yeah, there are climate-minded Liberals who think that, uh, you know, the world is going to heck in a handbasket and it's time to provide added strength to the, to the Green Party. But the Green Party... Uh, is is embroiled in internal warfare. I mean, they can't even get their own act together, so who knows what that represents. What do you think about the situation that we're seeing on the news about Afghanistan? Uh, oh, it's yeah, terrible. Yeah. It's, uh, it's I mean, you've been there. You've been to Afghanistan. So. Yeah, I spent a week in Kandahar at Kandahar Airfield, and uh, we didn't get out to, into the community that much. But, you know, I'm, I'm always struck. I was talking to my wife about this this week as we were watching the, the imagery of uh, Kabul airport and, and uh, you know, just the uh, terrible circumstances that uh, pro-NATO, for, um, pro-NATO Afghans find themselves in today. I, re- I recall being given a tour of the air base, and one of the military people said, you look around, you see all these boxes here, all of these boxes. Um, in, inside the boxes, these are giant containers like you see on container ships. This is all warfare. There's everything that you can imagine is in here. And he, it, while he was telling me uh, and describing what was in these boxes, I look across the fence uh, at a distance and I see a small hill and one Afghan standing on it looking back at us. And, uh, you know, I, I assumed he was a farmer, but it's just one person he's looking back at us. But, and the, the military person who was describing what we had at the base, he said this represents $1 trillion worth of warfare military might right here on this base alone and that was in 2010 uh, in 20, so who knows yeah, what they yeah, spent yeah. over the full might and, oh. and they couldn't defeat the taliban yeah it's um uh, it's terrible what's happening right there right right now so i noticed i heard on the news this morning japan has 25,000 reported 25,000 COVID cases today. A month ago, they had 2,500. Yeah, and a month ago was uh, the start of the Olympics. The Olympics, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it takes a couple of weeks for uh, whatever, you know, whatever uh, COVID effect happens in the population through commingling. I, I don't know if it can, there's a direct correlation. They want correlation. their government, they want the government to resign. We'll see what happens there. But what do you think about New Zealand, okay, in New Zealand, one case, they shut down the whole country. Yeah, and it's not one the case, first time they case, do that. One case, one case. It's not the first, but Rob, it's not the first time they do that. Boy, they jump on it, right? They jump on it right away. They attenuate it. It's like you're in a in a haystack and you drop your cigarette. I don't smoke, but I'm just making the point that you yeah. drop your cigarette in that haystack. You better put it out quick, otherwise you're going to have a bonfire. And uh, you know we're seeing that uh, rates are going up in New Zealand a little bit, so they're they're stamping it out as much as they can. Australia, same problems. You talk about Japan, uh, Nova Scotia is up, Saskatchewan is up big time uh, and uh, we're seeing that uh, across the United States who knows where it's going it's not looking good but worse from that is you know when you're starting to hear about people who've been double vaccinated who are getting COVID and you know Lindsey Graham in the United States the American senator the governor of um, of Texas uh, Hinken Looper who I think is either a senator or a congressman former governor of Colorado he's got it um, and so now these people are getting it as well let's hope they they, they stay out of hospitals. But for those who end up in hospitals, Rob, what it, what does it mean for those of us who don't get COVID? It means that if you need a hip replacement, it means if you need a blood transfusion, it means that if you need some other kind of surgery or you need a hospital bed, yep. maybe you won't have access to it. Exactly. That's the other problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said, Pierre. Hey, thank you so much. We'll talk next week. My pleasure, my friend. Have a great weekend. Stay cool. Uh, Pierre okay. Bork from Bork News Watch. We're right back into election 44 and the race in Canada Carlton the liberal candidate joins us Jenna Suds this is city news it's a space that needs to be lived in it's a space that people you know have to have an experience of more than just art on the walls i think you know yes the art on the walls is fun and it's fun to walk around and see all the beautiful things and, and, and the way Dominic and Edith have curated the gallery is certainly uh, something worth seeing. But uh, yeah, coming by and asking questions, again, to Dominic's point of view is, you know, interrupt him, ask questions. Uh, you know, I'm here on 
most of the days too. We have Luce that comes in, Nancy that comes in. So yeah, we have quite a few opportunities for people to come in and you know uh, see the process and of course ask a few questions. It's a great space. Uh, basically the one event that we do do or we did do <laughs> is, the, um, is the jazz shows, the jazz and blues shows and I think the weird thing to let you know is that the acoustics in here are really amazing. Uh, I think that was the first thing that blew me away when, when we started doing shows or when I was part uh, helping out with the shows. Um, and uh, the other part of the business too is we do rent it out for special occasions too. So a few weddings, uh, birthday parties, uh, product launches, that kind of thing. So they're also a lot of fun. We do have one artist that's, that's from the States, but uh, yeah, not, of the 30 odd artists, uh, the rest are from either Quebec, Ontario, and one uh, beautiful woman from BC. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely part of the philosophy to, to maintain and uh, canvas and show uh, the beauty that we have in our backyard. You have the very, very strong personalities in, in Edith and Dominic, of course. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see how that actually balances out in the rest of the gallery. Um, without necessarily being, you know, um, an objective, uh, we basically have half female artists and half male artists in this gallery. Uh, but it, I can't say it's anything more than choosing the best people, you know, and that's just the way it is. And I love that. I think it, it's great. You know, we've, you go through here and you're like, wow, it's all pretty cool. And yep, you know, it's half are women and half are men. It's cool. Like everyone else, we didn't know what to think, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's overwhelming at first. You just know that things are closed. Um, and now you're trying to figure out what you do during that, that downtime, which I think everyone did. And I think it's a, in March, the, the, the first close, the, the first shutdown, uh, it was a lot of actually recuperating and resting and, 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 and not worrying too much on the spot. Um, you know, it's, uh, running a gallery is a bit like running a marathon with sprints. Um, so there comes a time where, yeah, it's actually nice to just take a break. Uh, and then you wake up and realize that, okay, now it's time to, uh, to wake up and deal with this new reality. From my perspective anyways, I, I, I think a gallery can be overwhelming and I like to make it fun. So you're gonna come in, I'll ask you questions. I might even joke around with you. You know, the most people come here, they're not really gonna buy art, but they could have a fun time and talk about it, right? Uh, and one of the things the gallery does offer is for, you know, for local um, purchases, we'll be happy to drive it to your house and hang it for you. changing so keep up with rob the rob snow show returns on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 am jenna suds is the liberal candidate in the federal election in canada carlton and she joins me on city news this morning good morning Good morning. Thanks for having me. Oh, you say that now. now <laughs> n- <laughs> nice to hear from you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, so, the, you know, the most basic uh, of questions during an election campaign is why you and not the other candidate? Sure. Why, why you, Jenna Suds? Why would I vote for you? Well, uh, I think that I have uh, certainly a track record of being very involved and serving our community, obviously, as city councillor for the last three years and deputy mayor role as well. I've been very involved uh, since I moved here 20 years ago, and uh, I'm really eager and excited to get to work to serve the residents of our beautiful Canada Carleton area. Okay. All right. Um, I, I was away for a couple of weeks on vacation, so I'm. I uh, forgive me. I'm. I was kind of tuned out for a while, as you uh, and uh, unpl- you. unplugged, as you can imagine. So, I, I just want uh, to understand your current status as a city councillor. You have taken a leave. Sure. If, is that right? You're on leave right now. Correct. I've taken leave without pay. Leave without uh, pay during okay. the election, so right. I can obviously. Uh, do the work that's needed throughout the campaign. But having said that, uh, I'm still very committed, of course, to my residents and am continuing to uh, to work with them on issues as they come up and important files, of course, that are ongoing. Okay. All right. But leave without pay. Correct. All right. You're not drawing a salary right now. Okay. I'm not. All right. Okay. <laughs> but you are... Your plan would be, I'm assuming, you would return to city council if you were defeated. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Why wouldn't you just resign from council? 
Well, I think uh, we're quite fortunate in that I'm, I'm bringing a, a wealth of experience uh, to this campaign and to our community, frankly. So uh, regardless of the outcome of this election, I'm here to serve the community, whether that be continuing in my councillor role or, of course, uh, at the MP level, the federal level. Okay, you, would be, you could be accused of hedging your bets, though. How would you uh, respond to that? Well, I, you know, again, I think I'm here to serve. And I was obviously elected as the city councillor here in Canada North, which is a great honour. Um, and happy to continue doing so, but at the same time, happy to uh, step into the role to serve at the federal level, uh, if I am so lucky to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think uh, I'll just continue to work on behalf of of residents and and earn their trust. Well, that's it, though. You were elected as a city councillor, and you're not even going to finish one term. I've been here now for almost three years, um, as, right. as I'm sure you know, Rob, of course, these election timing do not line up. They never do. Um, it is, I'm certainly not uh, the first individual to be in this circumstance, and uh, when the opportunity comes up, uh, again, I'd love to serve in, uh, in a new capacity on new issues at the federal level. And if I'm going to have the opportunity to do so, this is, uh, you know, this is unfortunately the way it unfolds. Uh, it was never my intention, of course. I, I've been honoured to serve as city councillor. Uh, and it's just been a tremendous opportunity and experience. Okay. But you, some might say... If you be, leave city council and become an MP, you'll be leaving a lot of work undone. Um, you have the club link issue is far from over. Uh, the official plan would is going to have great impact, not just on Canada North, but in every ward all across the city. Mm-hmm. And for all intents and purposes, Canada North would be in limbo. It, don't know if. It, a uh, councillor would have to be appointed, whether it would have to be a by-election at tremendous cost, maybe $500,000. How do you justify that, Jenna Sutz? Well, you know, those are actually two really great uh, examples, Rob. So the first one being the golf course. Uh, that, uh, that landed on my lap 10 days into my term as city councillor. And uh, I'm very proud of the work that I've done and the communities rallying around that issue. And I'm also very proud that all of my colleagues unanimously unanimously supported me in rejecting that uh, development application. So the city uh, stood up in a big way and has denied that. And then we have the legal process, which uh, we were successful at the Supreme Court, and now we're waiting on the appeal court decision. So that is really now in the hands of our, our justice system. Um, I am very optimistic that the appeal court will uh, rule in our favor. Uh, but at this time, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate, this is a, it's a legal matter that, uh, that we wait on. Um, I will always be here on that issue. Uh, I am, my family is directly impacted as well as hundreds, thousands of people in our community, and, and I am not shying away from that, uh, regardless of what the, in, uh, the outcome uh, is. On the official plan, uh, the official plan, of course, is coming forward uh, this fall. And this has been a process that's been underway throughout my entire term of, of council here. So the amount of work that has gone into that to now be bringing forward the plan, um, I am incredibly proud of the plan that's coming forward. We've made tremendous progress. Uh, We've included a special economic zone as the Canada North Technology Park, which is, you know, a new and and really important part of this plan as we think about uh, employment and, and diverse communities that can include new housing projects. So I am very comfortable with where this is going. There's been an incredible amount of consultation throughout this process. And when it's brought forward, I know that it reflects what I have heard from Canada North residents. Okay. I, okay. Thank you for, for those answers. I want to get uh, more into kind of the mechanics of your campaign. How, how are you campaigning? What's it like to be out there? Just when you go and try to make your pitch to someone in Canada North. Um, mm-hmm. 
What's that look like? Are you, do you knock on the door? Where do you stand? Uh, yeah. What's it look like, uh, Jenna? Sutton? Yeah, it is, it is obviously challenging times, of course, acknowledging the pandemic we're still in. Um, I have been knocking out, do- knocking on doors uh, every day uh, since the since the election was called. Uh, for me, I, I am masked uh, always, and I'm always uh, knocking and then stepping back at least six feet, making sure that people are comfortable and we have a safe space between us. Um, I've been very well received. I haven't. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't had any concerns so far on the campaign. It's it's mm-hmm. wonderful. And to be honest, it's the best part of of a campaign is just getting out, knocking on doors, and and hearing what's on people's minds. Okay. Um, so so far, it's gone very well. What would you say are the top few issues that you're hearing at the door for you? Well, of course, the top is still the pandemic. Uh, this pandemic. is very much front and center on people's minds. Um, the vaccine rollout, of course, still ongoing. Um, this is uh, the main issue that people are raising at this point in time. Okay. What about the price of a house in Canada? Uh, house pricing, obviously. I mean, the last cost of uh, living. Say, uh, you know, these uh, issues. The last year or so has certainly uh, we've certainly seen a huge increase in, in housing prices and and cost of living in general. I think that's fair to say. Uh, certainly the pandemic has put pressures uh, on our economy in ways we never would have imagined. Uh, so that, that is a discussion point and I think an issue that uh, our government continues to work on. Okay. I thank you for your time this morning. Good luck to you. Thank you. My okay. pleasure. Bye-bye. We're Thanks watching it with, we were watching it with great interest. <laughs> thank okay. you. Yep. The race in uh, Canada-Carleton, it is very much one to watch. Provincially, it is... Um, a progressive conservative riding. It is. Uh, it had been liberal. Uh, Karen McCrimmon uh, stepped aside. Jenna Suds is hoping uh, to keep it a liberal seat. Canada Carlton, one to watch on election night. Back with the talk back hour Friday free for all at seven five zero thirteen ten. Who won the week in the federal election campaign? Give me your thoughts on that question. We're right back after the news on City News. FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM.
It's Friday, August 20th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now under a heat warning, 22 degrees in Ottawa. It feels like 31. It's 23 and feeling like 31 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Ottawa police are asking you to avoid the Queen Elizabeth driveway near Dow's Lake. An investigation underway now after a single vehicle crash sent one person to hospital this morning. Now, police are looking for witnesses to the crash. It happened around 1.30. If you have any information or maybe dash cam footage, you're asked to contact Ottawa police. Now, paramedics tell City News this morning a man they treated is 20 years old and had critical injuries, but they believe his condition was upgraded to stable. Once again, Ottawa police asking you to avoid that area. United States is extending restrictions of non-essential travel at land and uh, crossings until September 21st now. U.S. Department of Homeland Security says in a tweet the measures are kept in effect, reducing the spread of COVID-19, including the Delta variant. It says it will keep ensuring the flow of essential trade and travel, but non-essential travel, that once again is uh, restricted at least until September 21st. A new poll out suggests most Canadians support the idea of a vaccination passport for non-essential businesses, but some are opposed to the idea. Here's City News reporter Carl Hansky. And the new poll finds 76% of Canadians want some type of proof of vaccination system set up for non-essential services like bars. But that still means, of course, almost one quarter of Canadians are opposed. Nobody should be forced to get vaccinated to do things that they want to do. Now, Quebec is introducing a vaccine passport that will apply in places like bars and festivals where there are lots of people in confined spaces. But even those who support it say it offers no guarantees. You can still get COVID from being vaccinated. Yeah. Maybe it's not as harsh, but there's still a possibility. Yeah. I mean, if you have a passport, you still could yeah. make people sick. Yeah. But most Canadians, according to the poll, want something to better protect them from the Delta variant. I'm Carl Hansky. City News Time, 10.03. It is going to feel like it's in the 40s at least until Tuesday, possibly Wednesday next week. We are under a heat warning from Environment Canada, and City News meteorologist Jill Taylor says this is going to be a pretty long stretch. Oh, it is a stretch, prolonged stretch of heat and humidity. Heat warning continues. We've got this huge dome of heat over us and it will last several days. Now, this is the fourth heat warning of summer and second this month in our region. Temperatures expected to be in the low 30s today, tomorrow, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday and feeling closer to 40 with the humidity. Right now in Ottawa, 22 degrees. It feels like 31 in Smith Falls. It's 23, also feeling like 31. Immigration Minister Marco Mendicino says his department will accelerate the processing of families of interpreters and others who supported Canada's mission in Afghanistan to quickly evaluate as many approved people as possible. In an interview with the Canadian press, Mendicino says the department is ramping up the processing of Afghan refugees, adding resources to that operation. He says also the government is not requiring things like a passport or COVID-19 negative test from any passenger leaving Afghanistan. They will be deferred to screen at a third country where it's safe for evacuees and government officials to take various readings. Mendocino says the main obstacle remains Taliban checkpoints that Afghans have to get through in order to reach the airport in Kabul. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. And it's the Friday free-for-all. And that's our favorite hour of the week around here. Because we don't come up with the topics, you come up with the topics. And we just roll with it. Now, we usually like to stick to things that are in the news, but that is not a hard and fast rule, okay? It's not carved in stone. We're pretty much open to talking about just about anything. I mean, maybe maybe your topic is a minor pet peeve. Maybe you're going to blow the whistle on a major scandal. Maybe you think it's just, it's something that, it, Rob, 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 that you have to talk about this. this is, it should be in the news. Whatever it is, whatever it happens to be. Call me and we'll boot it around, okay? Call in line 750-1310, 750-1310, 
1310. My email address, by the way, is therobsnowshow at ottawa.citynews.ca. I mean, the federal election campaign dominated the news this week, and I'd love to get your thoughts this morning on how you think the campaign is going for the parties. For example, what about this question? Okay. Who won the week? Who won the week? And I, I would say so far, and this is just my own opinion, I don't think the Liberals' first week went very well at all. I think the conservative campaign is going surprisingly well, but I had very low expectations. And uh, the New Democrats are hanging in there, and the NDP is much better funded this time around, and it shows they can actually afford a plane for this campaign. Now, they can't afford two campaigns like the Trudeau Liberals did last time, but hey, one step at a time. I thought the Liberals won the first day or two, but since then, it's... Man, oh man, it's been sloppy. It's been uh, it's been lackluster. It hasn't had any sharpness. It hasn't had any focus. Um, it hasn't had anything that has been compelling to me at all. And at times, it has come across as kind of desperate, like like they're just throwing whatever pops into their head. They're just throwing it out there, and they're hoping that it sticks. And I think that's because, and again, these are just my own modest observations. I think that's because the liberals have yet to, declare, to clearly define why it is we're doing this. Why Mr. Trudeau has decided we have to put Canadians even through this exercise that in the end is going to, to cost more than $600 million. Imagine the health care you get for $600 million. The work you could do in First Nations communities for $600 million. The improvements to social wel welfare you could do for $600 million. Other than Justin Trudeau's ambition, his quest for more power, why are we even doing this? When there are so many other things government could be doing right now. Like I asked you on Monday, what's it all about? Right? In my own opinion... He has yet to really offer anything credible on that front. He says it's the most consequential election since the end of the Second World War. But I think a lot of Canadians are seeing right through that. I think they know that the election is about nothing more than a prime minister who craves a majority government. Now, I am not guaranteeing that it's going to come back to bite him, but it could come back to bite him. I still think the Liberals have to be the heavy favorites to win this thing. But if the rest of the campaign is like the start of the campaign, I think their quest for a majority government is very much in doubt. I think we could very easily end up right back to where we started with a, a Liberal minority government beholden to the other left-wing parties to move forward with any kind of legislative agenda. So who won the week? Is a question I would have for you, but uh, it's the Friday free for all, so anything goes. Michelle, Ottawa, you're on City News. Good morning. We won the week, Rob. We won the week. Okay, when who's Tom we? Mulcair, who's we? Who's we? The Conservative the Party of Canada. Okay. Right. When Tom Mulcair is on national television saying that the Conservatives won the week and that Mr. O'Toole is proving to be a formidable formidable opponent and saying that Mr. O'Toole's French is very good. We've won the week here when this is what we're talking about. But if I he, can did he, back, uh, did he say that this week? He said that he on said that last night on uh, Evan Solomon. Oh, he did. Okay, okay, I exactly missed that. Exactly okay. those words. Pretty close, anyway. Right. Um, okay. But listen, we started the week with Nova Scotia winning a majority government, and the reason they won is because of health care. Many people there don't have a doctor. They have an aging population. They're in, we are entering the scariest wave of this pandemic. So the whole country is in the same boat. People need a doctor. And in my family's doctor's office, right there hanging on the wall is a picture with a quotation, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Our doctor is a great doctor, and we're lucky to have him. If you force our doctor to have an to participate in any type of abortion, he will be the start of an exodus, not as large as the exodus of women that were in Justin Trudeau's inner circle, but still, he will leave here and go work elsewhere. We need these great doctors. And I don't understand why somebody didn't hit Mr. Trudeau yesterday with that and say, listen, we don't have 
have enough doctors. You're going to force doctors to do something morally they're against. They are out of here. One last thing. Okay. Jenna Sud, city councillor, plucked from her council membership by the Liberal Party. The Liberals have done the same thing in Calgary with a guy named George Shahal. I think I'm pronouncing it yep, correctly. Yep, yep, they yep. plucked him right from municipal council as well. I am so tired of these Liberals headhunting people who are already run for at the taxpayer's expense, got a job, are in there. It's just money. Why should we worry about it? And why shouldn't these people be able to jump to a better job? And what, how can they stand there morally like they're doing somebody a favor? Does the local Liberal at EDA councils across the country? Do they not have anybody qualified? Do they not have anybody who's put the work in? Pathetic week, Mr. Trudeau. Keep it coming, dear. Okay, Michelle. All right, thank you. Thank you. Who won the week? That's one of the questions that's out there. Barry in Ottawa. Barry, good morning, Barry. Good morning, Rob. Morning, Barry. Well, I think it was pretty even all around, actually. Pretty even all uh, around, okay. I think uh, Jagdeep Singh uh, actually showed... uh, uh, you know, some very cool and calm uh, purveyance of all the problems and things. Uh, also, uh, the Conservatives uh, did a lot better than I thought. And I think uh, Trudeau really uh, showed some frustration. And, you know, that little uh, shot he said about uh, not caring about the monetary system or what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. monetary that, policy, yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think that really put him down and... Uh, showed people that uh, he was frustrated that he wasn't getting his own way and that some of the, a lot of the public opinion were was against him. And uh, I think it's good that he's finally being shown uh, that he's got a lot of faults and uh, hasn't done a lot of his uh, stuff that well. All right, Barry, thank you for the call, sir. Thank you. Barry, but nevertheless, Barry says it's even after the first week. Lois in Ottawa. Good morning, Lois. Good morning, Rob. Yes, yeah, nice to hear from you. I am concerned about the direction our country is going. Okay. What has you concerned, uh, Lois? Thanks to Justin Trudeau, Me Too has hit again. Mayor, Major General Dan Fortin a distinguished career. Mm. He even served in Afghanistan. Allegation over 30 years ago. Yes. Between January and April. Right, right. And he is a guilty one. Under criminal... Well, well he's been charged. Yeah, he's been charged. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, he's yes. Yeah. 271-A... Under the criminal code, he's charged. What happened to innocent until proven guilty? Instead, we have this allegation, anonymous, totally accepted as the truth. And all over the newspaper, I am so sick of it. Well, it's also in the newspaper today that he's on temporary assignment and is working at an, as an advisor at D&D headquarters right now. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. didn't. It's that's, in today's, that's in today's newspaper, so you may have yeah. missed that, Lois. But um, he I will didn't. have a chance to defend himself, of course. I, 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 I think it's going – I'll be interested – I'll certainly be paying close attention to this case because I'll be interested to see how the Crown goes about trying to prove something – because it, you would think it would have to prove when the offense actually happened. Okay, did it happen in January or did it happen in April? Yeah. Because it says sometime between January and April. Well, what, was it January, February, March, April, 30 years ago? Yeah, 30 years very difficult, ago. very difficult to prove something like that. But we'll see. They must. The Crown must think it has a, a credible case, can make the case. They charged the guy. So... We'll yeah, see what happens with it, Lois, but I, I understand what you're saying. I understand. You you believe that his reputation has been sullied, right? Whoa. Innocent to proven guilty. Innocent until proven guilty. Yes, That's ma'am. Yes, not ma'am. what our country is about. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Okay, well, we're right back. That's, uh, boy, that's a quick... 15 minutes of talk radio right there. That's how the, we roll on the Friday free-for-all. And it's your turn next at 750-1310. Rob Snow Show, City News.
The food cupboard started about 25 years ago. Again, it was a very small operation in the basement of a church. Uh, and we have been expanding to the point where we needed to have a new facility. So in discussion with the, the city of uh, Ottawa and Jan Harder, the local uh, representative here, uh, we came to this location, which is about 2,000 square feet, located in the Walter Baker Centre. We've been here for about two years, and it is much better. It gives us a much broader opportunity to serve our clients better. It's a fairly affluent community in Barhaven, so you wouldn't think that people would really need to have a food bank or a food cupboard. But people sometimes have a temporary loss of their job, uh, maybe new immigrants or refugees to the community, Maybe there's been an injury in the family or something like a pandemic that uh, causes uh, people to run short of food during their, their monthly requirements. So we uh, offer uh, any clients who come and live in our catchment area the opportunity to pick up an order of food every, every three, week, three or four weeks. The need varies from time to time. Uh, we have expanded our offering to include quite a few perishables, uh, eggs, milk, cheese, yogurt, vegetables, um, uh, fruit, uh, but people, people I think know that we need cans of beans and stuff as well too. One thing that we're, we're consistently short of sometimes is uh, personal hygiene products. You go to the grocery store, you buy your toothpaste and you buy your deodorant and shampoo there. Uh, people don't automatically think that to, to donate those kinds of things to a food cupboard. So we end up buying quite a few of those things from time to time. The pandemic has, has affected us like it has everybody. Initially, we had to stop the grocery store uh, food donations uh, so that we didn't have any risk of contamination and, and to, to have a significant number of volunteer work to be done in our facility. We have a, a storefront, so it's like a mini grocery store where you take a cart and you go around and pick out the things that you want. That doesn't work during the pandemic to maintain social distancing and so on. So what we have now is our clients can come in one at a time, they make an appointment, they stand behind a line, and they direct our volunteer to, you know, I'd like Kellogg's Corn Flakes rather than Harvest Crunch, uh, to pick the, the food that they would like off the shelves according to the allocation, depending on the size of their family. And then they take it out, uh, load it into their vehicle or whatever, bring back the cart, we disinfect everything, and prepare for the next client. We are very blessed here in Barhaven. Uh, we're a totally volunteer organization, so if you give a, a dollar to us, it goes to purchasing food or to provide some service to our clients. It's time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Friday free for all. Talk back our Rob Snow show. Robert in Ottawa, you're on City News. Good morning. Morning. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I like to say that uh, I like living where I live, but every election time, I, I, I'm not crazy about it because in my area, it's never going to get flipped from red to blue. Okay. Where do you um, live? Where do you live? Uh, well, McGinty is my um, is my. Uh, oh, you live in McGinty Land, okay? Yeah, <laughs> Ottawa McGinty South, Land. Ottawa South. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, fair but, enough. Uh, the reason I'm calling is uh, about homelessness. I'm not sure if you're aware, and really, the only reason I'm calling is because hopefully someone will listen to this that can do something about it. But there are three uh, places in Ottawa where I've noticed homeless people camping out uh, okay. under the Hunt Club Bridge that goes over Riverside. Oh, okay. Uh, there's like a tent under there, and there's somebody camped out there. Under the Bronson Street Bridge that goes over Queen Elizabeth Drive by Dow's Lake. I think there was an accident there this morning. Um, right, right. Okay, yeah, okay. And under the LRT Bridge that goes from Ottawa U, crosses the Rideau River over to Riverside Drive. There's been a tent there for months. They've recently moved into the bushes, like uh, not directly under the bridge, but into the bushes. But they're still there. And I don't know if someone can do something about it or okay. it's allowed or what, but... We never used to see stuff like this in this city. No, and it, no. it kind of just, you know, I feel for the people that are homeless, but at the same time, there's got to be a better solution. Well said, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for bringing that to my attention and our listeners' attention. And uh, we'll be following up on that. Uh, David is making a note of that right now that we're going to follow up on that. 
As a matter of fact, 1020 here, Rob Snow Show, City News. Uh, one of the big issues is, is, of course, the election campaign. First week of the election campaign. Y- you think about the week that the Liberals had, the hits, the misses. They tried to create a wedge issue with the Conservatives on vaccine mandates. And it worked, I will say. It worked for a day or two. It did. It knocked the Conservatives off their key messages for a couple of days. And because it's a short campaign, the shortest allowed by law, time is of the essence, right? So you don't, you don't want to lose any days, let alone, say, lose two days of your Aaron O'Toole. And the Conservatives, they got all tied up in knots trying to explain where they stood on this whole mandatory vaccine business. To the point that they had to issue a news release one night at like 10 o'clock at night. They had to explain some more where they stood. And remember the old line. I keep repeating this old line for you, okay? In politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. And they had they were doing a lot of explaining for the first couple of days, which meant they're losing. Um, but then the whole thing fizzled out because it it became basically like a like a double patted nothing burger because it came to light that O'Toole's stance on vaccines for public servants is exactly the same as Treasury Board's policy. And Treasury Board's in charge of the public service. And then you had this spectacle of the PSAC, right? Largest public sector union saying to the Liberals and the New Democrats, whoa, 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 just hold on a second here. And, you know, PSAC, believe me, no love for the Conservatives. We all know that. So to me, um, that's not even an issue anymore. Vaccine mandates federally. I think that's totally, that, that, that is over as an issue. And uh, the situation in Afghanistan, catastrophe. And uh, the scene of the prime minister triggering this needless election the day that Kabul falls to the Taliban. He's still having a hard time getting out from underneath that, I think. Uh, Rob, uh, not Rob, uh, Steve in Westboro. Pardon me, Steve, Westboro. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, I'm hanging in there, buddy. How about you? Yeah, well, you know, um, I think the NDP won the week. The NDP won the week. Okay, why do you say that? Mr. Singh came up with some very, very important points in this country about housing. Okay. He's he's done a great job as trying to be a a person for the average poor people. And uh, for the little guy. One other thing that hurt that really scares me about O'Toole. Balancing the budget and private health care. Okay, uh, that wh- really wh- scares me. Why does that scare you? Why, why is oh, it scary to scary. Ba- why is it scary to balance the budget, sir? Because who is he going to cut? Seniors and everybody else, like Doug Ford, when he got into power, the first thing he did was go after autism children and their mothers, sir. No, I I, I don't think so. But well, um, he did go after them. No, he didn't go after them. No, no. No, that that file has that file has has been a problem, sir, under multiple governments. Okay, there were promises made by Premier McGinty that were never lived up to. There were promises made by Premier Wynne; she never lived up to them. There were there were people who were taking their children to Queens Park when Premier Wynne was in power in Ontario and threatening to leave them there, sir, because the support was so inadequate. Okay, okay, so, so be, maybe, o- be honest, Steve. Be okay. honest when you talk about the autism file. Okay? Well, you know, know a little bit of the history piece, of the right? file, Steve. Know a little bit of the history of the file before okay. you come on here and talk about it like that. Okay, what, about, right? what about the vaccine? I think Justin Trudeau has done a great job in Ontario. He, well, it's, it certainly was a, a, a turnaround story. It did not start out well, but it, it, is, it has worked out in the end. I'll and give he him credit people for that. that were that didn't have money because of the COVID. He's helped. Oh yeah, sure. Rent. He helped all kinds of people who didn't have money for the, for uh, during the COVID, and he helped lots of people who had lots of money during the COVID, sir. He well, was sending well, fifteen-year-olds checks for two thousand dollars a month. What about the people Steve? that were poor? That were well, the sure. Job? Send it to poor people, Steve. I have no problem. You want to send checks to poor people? Poor people actually need the money. A fifteen-year-old right. living in a five thousand square foot home out in Canada Lakes with mom and dad. Doesn't need two thousand dollars a month. That's six hundred million dollars spent on giving checks like that to fifteen-year-old well, Steve. I'd Do you ra- think that was money well spent, Steve? Give your head a shake, buddy. Come on, come on. Bob in Ottawa. Bob. Yes. How are you? 
I'm fired up today, Bob, well, and I'm usually kind of relaxed on a Friday well, morning, to uh, tell you the truth. <laughs> Join the club. Uh, what I'm calling about is Afghanistan. There's so many issues, but it just breaks my heart. And I was watching Power in Politics the other day, and Mark Garneau was on, and he was asked, uh, would you do anything differently in this file? And his response was no. And r right now, no. they're like okay. they had, Rob, they had, since 2014, the troops pulled out. They had uh, five years to get them out of there, and now they're saying they can't get them out because the Taliban have come in. Well, duh, they knew this was going to happen, you know? And now uh, Mendocino is saying today, well, they're trying to get them out, but they can't get through the Taliban to get to the airport. And uh, so it's on Sajan, like he was over there, uh, the defense minister. Sajan, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. like he he uh, knew firsthand what the, the interpreters and the drivers well, did. Well, he served them, there, they yeah. Lives. Sure, he served there, yeah. And yep. the prime minister knew all this. And so, as you said earlier, what does he do on the very day? He trots across to the governor general's house and calls an election. Yeah, the day it's the just, Kabul falls. The day the Kabul falls. Sir. It is yeah. despicable. And yeah. it's, it's on, I hate to say, but the blood is on their hands. And they, they, they will die because they're being hunted by the Taliban. They got the records from the local, the, you know, the government that was in power. They got the records, and it, it, it's a hunting season. They're going after them, and, and my heart is breaking. I heard a guy on your station the other day talking, and he was in tears. His wife is there, and he can't get her out. Yeah. Like, this is horrific. Yeah. And, and in England, they're going after the foreign minister and grilling oh, him. Oh, yeah, they want him to quit. They but want him to quit because he missed a phone call. But, Rob, there's nothing happening here. Where's the furor? Where's the anger at these? And they fail on the wa clean water for um, the uh, uh, First Nations. Yeah, First Nations communities. They fail yeah. on so many places. And uh, okay. I'm sorry, Rob, I get, I'm getting That's worked okay. up. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, Bob, you and me, deep breaths, buddy. Deep breaths. Okay, let's... And, uh, and a very quick thing. We, uh, yeah. We're 74, and we received a $500 bribe the other day. Oh, yeah, 500 bucks. You got your Justin bucks. So yeah. what we're doing is we're sending it on to charity. I would well, ask anybody you. that can afford it, send it on to charity. And I just want to send the message. So is it you and your wife, Bob? Yes. So did you get five hundred dollars and she got five hundred dollars? Yes, she did. We got so you got a thousand dollars. So wow, that's, go that's going to charity. And but you I didn't just even have to it. ask for it. Sorry. And you didn't even have to ask no. for it. Just no, well, showed it's up. A it's a bribe, <laughs> and I just want him to know that he didn't buy my vote. It'd okay. be a rainy day in in, in Sault Ste. Marie when he gets <laughs> my money. All right. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, all right, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Wow. Thousand bucks, just like that. Right? The day of the election campaign. It's just by coincidence, right, David? Just purely coincidence. I'm sure yeah. now. You can't yeah. read too much yeah. into hey, that. Hey, Steve in Westboro, now. what do you think of that, Steve? What do you think of that? Hey, a thousand bucks, just like that. Didn't even have to ask for nah, it. He's doing a heck of a yeah, job, yeah, that a Justin heck of a guy. Job. Yeah, real great steward he's of the economy. He's got our backs. There. I'm glad he doesn't care about monetary policy. Oh, yeah. 1029, back right after the news.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, August 20th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, under a heat warning, 25 degrees. It feels like 33 in Smith Falls, 26, and it feels like 34. One man is under arrest after a crash this morning on Queen Elizabeth Driveway that seriously injured a passenger. Now, police say they're looking for witnesses to the crash on the driveway. It happened about 1.30 this morning. 20-year-old passenger was taken to hospital with injuries described at the scene as critical. Paramedics told City News later this morning that the man's condition they believe was upgraded to stable. A jump in COVID cases in Ontario. The latest report shows 650 new cases of the virus today and two more deaths from COVID-19. Of those 650 cases... There are in the Ottawa Health Unit, uh, just clarifying those numbers in Ottawa, but three in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, one each in Leeds, Grenville, and Renfrew as well. Over 28,600 tests were done for these numbers. And once again, uh, those numbers in Ottawa, let's just double check. No, nope. we'll have those for you at 11 o'clock for sure. Border restrictions south now extended to September 21st after Canada reopened the border to non-essential American travelers already. The American restriction on Canadian and Mexicans was uh, to end uh, tomorrow. But now that has been extended due to COVID cases and the rising inf- incidence of Delta variant to September 21st. With this heat warning in effect, three cooling centers in Ottawa are opening in about a half an hour from now at 11 o'clock. The centers are located at City Hall, the Planned Rec Center, and the Overbrook Community Center. They will be open from 11 to 7 today for anyone who needs a place to cool down. City News Time, 1033. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. And it's a Friday free-for-all. But one of the big questions is who won the week? The PCs in Nova Scotia had a good week. Yeah, the surprise result in Nova Scotia caught a lot of people off guard. Didn't take me by surprise because I I pay attention. (laughs) Okay. To Nova Scotia politics. I'm from there. Uh, and sometimes my radio program airs actually in Halifax. So I gotta, they got to be up to date on that stuff. But I see a lot of talking heads are trying to say, well, you know, Tim Houston, he's uh, the premier designate in Nova Scotia. Tim Houston is more like Justin Trudeau than Aaron O'Toole. Right. Well, let me say this about that. When Justin Trudeau announced his child care agreement, with the premier, with the then premier of Nova Scotia, Ian Rankin. And uh, when he dispatched his MPs to make a dozen other pre-election announcements, um, he wasn't doing that to help Tim Houston. Okay, He was, he was doing that to help re-elect his liberal buddy, Ian Rankin. And Ian Rankin is a Justin Trudeau parrot. Okay. And just got smoked. And the PCs won. As I, as I said in my Snow and 60 commentary yesterday, there are a lot of takeaways from that campaign. Uh, one of them is message discipline. Healthcare, healthcare, healthcare is, is what Houston hammered away on. And it really registered. Um, the whole thing about monetary policy, that didn't break the liberals' way, did it? Just 24 hours earlier, Abacus Data releases some polling results, shows that the number one issue right now for voters, the cost of living. The inflation rate comes out from StatsCan. It's red hot, the hottest it's been in 20 years. Mr. Trudeau's asked about it in a weird technical way, a rather obscure question. He has nothing of depth to say about it. Okay? Gift wrapped. Not only for the conservatives, but also for the New Democrats, because Mr. Singh was campaigning on the West Coast. Uh, where you have to be a billionaire to afford a house. Look, people are worried about buying homes, priced out of the market, rents are climbing, prices at the grocery store are up, gas prices are way up. The Prime Minister has nothing of any significance to say about any of this. So, um, 
it's of no surprise to me that come the end of the week and barely a full week into the election campaign, the liberals would attempt to try and make the election about abortion. Pathetic, really pathetic and sad that they would do that. Uh, Andrew in Calgary. Andrew. Rob, my friend. Hey, uh, Trudeau was in Calgary yesterday. Yes, did you I, did you go he, to the rally? He or? was 10 minutes away from my house and he oh, really? fight me. Shame <laughs> on him. Okay. Um, so you know how much I loathe this man, right? You yeah, know yeah, I know, I know. I, I cannot stand him. I cannot I hear know, him. I know, I know. And, it's palpable, and, yes. And I was, I was an undecided voter um, thinking he did a good job with the pandemic. He actually helped me. He actually got me out of a jam because I'm a, I'm a small business owner and I relied on the help he gave me. And I'm like, you know what? He, he, he probably does care. He actually cares. Look, he helped me. He helped my family. And then came this week. I was still undecided. And he said he doesn't uh, really care about mon- uh, what, what did he say? He doesn't care about monetary uh, policy, mon- yeah. monetary policy. Right. Yeah. And can you translate that, that for the people? What that inflation. Means? Inflation, 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 the cost of ra- exactly. the cost of living. Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't care about inflation. And then it came to me. This is the same Justin Trudeau as prime minister. He doesn't know what it feels like to go to a grocery store and buy groceries. He doesn't know what it feels like to go fill up your van. And he doesn't know what it is to get your paycheck and try to divide to pay your bills. This is the same man. And then, and just like that, he lost my vote. Okay, Andrew. All right. All right. Stay cool, buddy. Stay cool. Um, let's go to Almont. Chris, you're on City News. Good morning, Chris. Yeah, I think uh, the Liberals had a, a bad week. A bad week, yes. Okay. And uh, wait till the two Michaels hit the thousand day mark, mm-hmm. which will be during the campaign. And the lack of action for the Afghan interpreters. Yeah. Everything. Everything. All coming together. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Nova Scotia elections, another good indicator. 984 days that Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver have been jailed in China. 984 days. And they'll hit the 1,000 just before the election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a little more than two weeks, right? It'll be a 1,000 days. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Chris, thank you. Thank you. It no said problem. here you wanted to talk about Danny Fortin. Did you want to... Ma- oh, yeah, Danny oh. Fortin's trial date's on the 20th of September. <laughs> oh, it's on the 20th. Well, maybe the next court date. Must be the next court the appearance. The next court date. Yeah, the next court appearance. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I guess what really surprises me is so early in the campaign they would they would play the abortion card that the liberals want to pay, play wedge politics with the most divisive social issue of our time, okay? And not even really tell the truth about it because it's not so much about reopening the abortion debate as a, as it is about so-called conscience rights. And I, I'm not even going to get into the abortion debate with anybody because it's impossible to have an adult conversation about it in this country because the two sides are so firmly entrenched. They're never going to see eye to eye on anything. But there certainly um, an interesting debate to be had about conscience rights when it comes to abortion or when it comes to doctor-assisted suicide. I mean, is this... I guess, uh, you know, for me, is this the liberal position now that a doctor should be forced to perform an abortion, Uh, coerced into performing an abortion? Is that the liberal position? Because that sounds like the liberal position now. Because the last time I checked, freedom of conscience is, is a fundamental charter right in this country. In fact, when the assisted suicide law passed, the MAID law, the government ensured the liberal, the liberals talked about this all the time. No doctor, no healthcare professional will be forced into doing it if, if they're opposed to it, if they're conscientious objectors to, to mate. No way. Don't worry. You know. So what? Miriam Monsef, Carolyn Bennett, who is not a nice person, okay, to begin with. We have reports of her about running a toxic workplace. Carolyn Bennett, we know about her what she said to Jody Wilson-Raybould. Um, they're not telling the truth to the Canadians. They're not giving it to them straight. It, they're trotting out this toxic issue instead to divide Canadians. Seriously, is this what they think people want to talk about? Abortion? 
after the last year and a half, everything everyone's been through? This is garbage. Liberals, you say you have a vision for the country. We all get it. You're pro-choice. Fine. Aaron O'Toole is pro-choice too. Stephen Harper had a majority government, attended an evangelical Christian church here in Ottawa, didn't move an inch on abortion. I'm going to tell you right now, okay? Mark my words. Whether the winner of the election is Justin Trudeau, Jugmeet Singh, Aaron O'Toole, nothing is going to happen on regulating abortion. Nothing. The last time any government tried to do anything on regulating abortion, it was the Mulroney government. It was 31 years ago. We had a free vote in the Senate, and it was a tie, 43 to 43. And nobody, no government, has come near it since. And it's not going to change, I guarantee you, in my lifetime or yours. We all know this. We all know this. So get on with things that actually matter in the here and now. Uh, Irene in Ottawa. Good morning. Uh, good morning. You're asking about uh, the, the election. Who um, won the week? Yeah, who won the week? Yeah. Well, it does, definitely wasn't um, Justin. Um, I find, I, I believe the Liberals, like they finished their campaign before they called the election because they were going all across the country, giving out money, you know, for weeks, child care, everything. And then when they called the election, they didn't have any ideas. Like, so they're starting to steal ideas from the Quebec, like the mandatory, uh, the vaccine passport. And then yesterday, I think it was where, uh, oh, they, they're going to train uh, PSWs and all that, like a year and a half later yep. into the pandemic. Yep. Then the day before it was a thousand, what, firefighters? A thousand you know? firefighters, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and he's got no ideas because they don't listen to the public. Yeah, yeah. They, plus, you know, he's doing a news conference right now. And the first question, he, his announcement today is, if reelected, my government will introduce 10 paid federal sick days. So a good first question from the reporter who said, well, look, you're promising this now on an election campaign, but let's let's face it, if you promised it, if you if you made this announcement in the House of Commons, you would have no trouble passing it because the NDP would say, Awesome, let's do it. You know, let's pass yeah. it. Let's pass it today. Right? So why are we having this election campaign? We don't need to have an election campaign for Trudeau to pass ten paid sick days. I think Nova Scotia threw him. I, I like with with the electing uh uh, the PCs. I was very pleased. I was very I pleased. I bet you were. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. I, I thought maybe now they're, they're not drinking his Kool-Aid anymore. Right? But I was looking in Nova Scotia. They don't have many PC candidates for the federal election. I, 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 I mean, like in um, uh, like um, the premier from New Glasgow in that riding, that's Peter McKay's old riding. Yes. Yeah. I don't think they have anyone going against the Liberal guy. Oh, really? Okay. I haven't looked right. at it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of scary. But anyway, let's keep our fingers crossed. And, and I think Aaron O'Toole is starting to look pretty good right now. Okay. Yeah, he's had a good week. No doubt about it. Yeah. It yeah. Okay. Thank you. But the, the numbers haven't moved all that much. Um, 30, 31% in the polls. You're not winning anything. If that's the best you can do is 30, 31%. Let's face it. Uh, be right back. Final quarter. Rob Snow Show City News Talk Back Hour. After this. When it came to opening the business, because I was so young, there was a lot that I didn't know about management, financial management, management of people, um, all around <laughs> management, I think is the word that I, I always come back to. Um, I think that I always had a passion and they knew that I wanted to create a space for people to get their hair done, but I had no idea, even having studied business management, what it really took to open a business as well as sustain a successful business. 
So in 2014, I was actually working with Angela Sutcliffe. Um, she was my business coach at the time, and she was like, what's your niche? Like, what separates you from other salons? And when we started to really dig, it was the curls. It was the fact that we work with all curl types, curly, kinky, wavy, coily, which is how we identify our curl types. Um, and then you have straight hair as well, of course. Um, but, you know, a, more than 70% of the world has some sort of curl pattern to their hair. And we just realized that that was not being addressed. It wasn't something we learned about in school. So that's, I you know, went to the States and, and I traveled all over to kind of gain the information that I have now to be able to share it with our clients and as well as with other sty stylists. So in March, when it came, I thought it was gonna last, you know, a week, two weeks, through, I think it started off at two weeks. And I was like, cool, I have two weeks to just relax, that's fine. So I was actually in a position where I was not happy, so to say, but I was a little bit happy, to be honest, um, just because of what I was experiencing personally. Now, when that extension started to happen, it was not a great feeling. It was very uncomfortable not knowing how I was going to support myself financially. So I'm so excited about the Academy. It's something that I started and I, I launched it during the pandemic. So I've been teaching for a, a number of years. I've been educating for a number of years. I educated at Algonquin. I've educated at Versailles Hair Academy. Um, and I've also educated in my own space, um, in this space and my old space up on Green Bank. And so it was just a continuum of what, you know, I've been doing for these years. When we have a client in our chair, it's not just about making your hair look great. It's about how do you go home and take the, what we've just taught you and emulate that. So now with a world where people want to quote unquote be diverse and inclusive, what does that really look like in a salon setting? And for me, it looks like being able to invite any curl type, any hair type really, you know, cause I can take care of straight hair types just as well as, you know, I can take care of curls. And we cater to all curl types regardless of what you look like on the outside, we got you. It's time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Catherine in Ottawa, you're on City News. Uh, hello, Rob. Hi, Catherine. Um, the, uh, I think Trust Justin Trudeau had a really bad week, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I'm glad about. Okay, um, I can't okay. stand the man. I don't right. think he has done anything for our country besides destroy it. Um, I'm uh, totally ashamed of our uh, Afghan um, situation. Mm. A long time ago, we have people walking across our borders illegally, cheating to get into the country. And meanwhile, we have people that put their life on the line and we hang them out to dry. That is absolutely ashamed. Like, I'm ashamed of being a Canadian when we have uh, actions like that. Um, I, you and Lowell were talking about the environment this morning and, and energy and whatnot. Yeah. And I yeah. would like to recommend a book I'm reading right now. It's called uh, Apocalypse Never, and it's by Michael Schellenberger. Okay. And he is an environmentalist. He's a humanitarian, but he's debunking all the... Oh, yeah, uh, I've heard about that book. Yeah, Schellenberg. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, I yeah. recommend it to everybody. Okay. Um, he he has, puts no faith in green energy. He says it's unreliable. Um, he well, says, it's not very... My only point is, and I'm just using the Ontario government's own electricity operator the you know the, the the agency that runs the electricity system publishes this every hour um you know this is going to be one of the hottest stickiest days of the year air conditioners are full blast a lot of demand for electricity and wind power is producing almost nothing the largest one in ontario is producing zero power today yeah, uh, and they're not environmental. Zero. <laughs> they're, they're, they're absolutely not environmental. Um, he, he says oh, nuclear. Just, for, I mean, when, you know, if you build 140 wind turbines and they don't work when you need the electricity on the hottest day of the year, what good are they? Yes, 
I mean, Precisely. it's just common sense to me, right? Precisely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, like, take he, it, he, you know, he, they're about as good as a hot bath today, Catherine, yeah. right? Okay. Well, they, I got to go. I got to go. We're jam packed here. Uh, Albert in Canada. Go ahead, Albert. Welcome back, Rob. Well, thank you, Albert. Very cool. um, while you were away, I want to quote something that was in the paper. All right. McCrimmon says revelations about per- pervasive sexual misconduct in the military didn't come as a surprise to her after 26 years as a ground bacon member of the Royal Canarian- Canadian Air Force. I could tell you stories that would curl your hair, McCrimmon said in an interview. Those revelations were not a surprise, but yet here's a woman that sings handily shut down the defense department's investigation so jenna suds this morning i just want to let you know that this is the type of clan that you're following hypocrites and it's a shame that a woman like mccrennan that has a, a couple of daughters herself wouldn't have wanted to help support women in the in the armed forces and 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 women in general to allegations of abuse Thank you, Rob. All right. Thank you, Albert. I'm glad to hear your voice, Albert. Glad you're still around, buddy. Glad you're still with us. Uh, Frontenac, Colin, good morning. Hey, how are you? Good, sir. Thank you. What's on your mind? I'm fired up. Yeah, I'm I'm fired up today. Yeah. Kind of fired up about fire destroying a lot of our country. Okay. And our lack of ability to, to deal with it. Right. Or technology to deal with it. You know, at one time, we used to be known as, like, peacekeepers in the world. Yes, at one time, yes. And uh, I would like Canada, as a a good job creation thing, to have the largest squadron air force of forest firefighters in the entire world. That we could put out our own fires. Northern Ontario's burning. Manitoba's burning. BC apparently has lost over 8,000 square kilometers. That's mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah. And it's still burning. Oh yeah, still on fire. It's destroying our. We're going to have less air now because. Right. That's so, a lot less so you know, why would we need an election campaign for Mr. Trudeau to say we're going to help train a thousand firefighters? Why? Well, so you know, do you think? Year, do you we think? We don't need a yeah. thousand firefighters. I think we need like, like a thousand water bombers. Water, water bombers. Yeah. That we yeah. Or why not make that kind of investment? Why not make that kind? Of fires. We could help put out the the Amazon was burning two years ago. I don't know if they even put that out. Right. Okay. So you want you know, more resor- like, more resources into firefighting in the because well, of the for damn sure. I mean, for damn sure. You, okay. You, would you want your cottage or your absolutely not, sir? I think down? about it, I have I think about it quite often now. As a matter so, of fact, so six hundred million on a on an election that wasn't needed. If we were to spend six hundred million, could we get those fires? I would out? imagine we could buy a lot of water bombers for six hundred million dollars. Yeah, we probably buy, probably Canada. probably buy about six hundred of them. Wouldn't you feel proud as a Canadian if we helped the entire world put out all their fires Absolutely. that were burning? Yeah. Not only that, they could be adapted to water. Sure. Problems. You know, why, why should uh, British Columbia have to rely on firefighters from Quebec? Yeah, do we all hate right. British Columbia, or why are we yeah. letting it burn up? Yeah, okay, Colin, good point, sir. Thank you. Uh, Keith in Shawville. How are you doing? Welcome good, back. sir. Thank you. Yep. I think the Tories should just show clips of Trudeau saying about how monetary policy, he doesn't think about it, the budget will balance himself, mm-hmm. and also the quote he did a couple of years ago when he admired the Chinese basic dictatorship. Yes, yes. They should just keep playing those over and over again. Play them over and People over don't realize where this guy's coming from. Okay. All right. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. All right. All right. A lot of people are in a venting kind of mood today, it seems. Jeff in Ottawa. Jeff. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Jeff. As for the Conservatives and the NDP leading, I think uh, they both did well, but Trudeau definitely did extremely poorly this week. Every stop he makes, he puts his big foot in his big mouth. What I'm concerned about and wondering is where is his big mouth, Jerry Diaz? Mm-hmm. I know he made this foolish, childish commercial, the same as the one with the Conservatives made about... Yeah. Chocolate well, you know, the thing is the writ period is underway right now, so the spending limits have come into effect now. So the unions can't it, there are very strict spending limits on third parties in the federal campaign. They're not allowed basically to spend almost anything. Oh, so he's not going to kiss Trudeau's butt anymore. Well, he, he well, in terms of advertising, the unions can't spend a lot of money. I think the spending limit is something like I don't know, 250 grand 
across yeah. the entire country. Where is his big uh, flapping gums? He was with the last <laughs> election. He was seriously there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm right here, Jeff. But I, 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 that's that's the reason why you're not hearing a lot from uh, Unifor is because of the spending limits. Um, Larry? Yeah, Larry. Let's take Larry's call here. Larry. Yeah, I am calling in to discuss the LRT just briefly. The LRT, yes. it's um, We only have, uh, what what is it, 10 cars out of service right now. 10 cars, yes. Yeah, so that, about a quarter. 25, 25% of the fleet, yeah. Yeah, and I literally, I have a friend who is two weeks ago, or I'm sorry, two months ago, bagging groceries, and now he's working for the LRT. I, I don't want to say their name, but... My point here is they're so desperate to hire people to work. Mm. I've got a friend who's not qualified, and he's told me this. Well, we what's, what's, what's he doing uh, working for the LRT? Well, I, I'd sooner not say I don't want to cause any trouble that All right, way, okay, all right, okay. My point is this guy has zero uh, experience in working on anything to do with rail, anything of that nature. Oh, okay. Nice, nice fellow and all, but <laughs> the point of my story is we were around a bonfire, he's telling me this, and I'm thinking, is there any wonder why we have uh, so many units out and constant headache and heartache? Like, we're back in the time we're going to have to go to horse and buggy. It, it'd be more reliable. <laughs> okay, all right. We're on time. <laughs> all right, Larry, okay. One more last call of the week on who won the week in the byword market. David, good morning, Dave. Very quickly, David. Uh, good morning, Rob. Yeah, yeah, just one quick thing. I yeah. think Aaron O'Toole, all he, what he has to do is just keep hammering the fact that this this election was completely unnecessary, especially during a pandemic, and just keep hinting that it was so he could get a majority and no other reason, and just say, but since we're having an election, uh, if you want to do something about this, vote for me kind of thing. And also he should um, kind of uh, go and... Uh, look at the people in Nova Scotia and say, look, you've just elected a PC, a provincial. If you really want him to get his, his, his thing through, his, his policy through, uh, I will help him with that. Okay. And Thank you. Think, Thank you, I David. Those are two Thank you. Points. Gotcha. Thank you, David. Thank you for all of your calls all week. Great conversations this week. We'll pick it up again during the Talkback Hour on Monday. We're right back after the 11 o'clock news with Elliot Finkelman on the cruise line business. Steve Warren on the Red Blacks game this weekend, and then Queen's Park Week in Review. Vaccine mandates in the Ford government. That'll be in focus for us. This is City News. frequency.
This is City News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, August 20th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now it is feeling in the low 30s. It's 25 degrees in Ottawa, 26 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. One man arrested after an overnight single vehicle crash that seriously injured a passenger. This happened near Dow's Lake. A white Hyundai Elantra sedan crashed on the Queen Elizabeth driveway east of Preston about 1.30 this morning. Now, Ottawa police say the driver was arrested at the scene. The passenger, a 20-year-old man, rushed to hospital in critical condition with serious injuries. Now, investigators would like to speak with witnesses or anyone who has dash cam footage of that crash this morning. You're urged to contact Ottawa Police Collisions Unit. Latest report shows 650 new cases of COVID-19 and two more deaths in Ontario. 22 of these new cases are in Ottawa under the health unit in the city. Three are in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, one each in eastern Ontario and the Renfrew County Health Unit. Over 26,600 tests were done for the numbers. The positive rate, 2.4 percent. We are under a heat warming warning. Environment Canada has that uh, in effect for the entire region. City News meteorologist Jill Taylor says it's this kind of heat which can also affect your air quality. You might want to cut back on outdoor exercising today. Air quality could be really impacted. It could slip into the 8 range, which is considered high-risk range. The higher the number, the higher the risk for feeling that discomfort in your eyes and your throat. Now, for the rest of the people, watch for signs of heat-related stress on your body, like a rash, swelling, or cramps. Three cooling centers in Ottawa are open today and tomorrow. The centers are at City Hall, Plant Recreation Centre and Overbrook Community Centre. Anyone wishing to cool off can go to any one of those centres from 11 in the morning until 7 in the evening on both days. City News Time 1103, Immigration Minister Marco Mendicino says his department will accelerate processing of families of interpreters and Canadian Afghan supporters to quickly evaluate as many approved people as possible. Right now, they're being flown out of Afghanistan to Kuwait while they will, they will undergo uh, the uh, checkpoints there before being allowed into Canada. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau says a re-elected Liberal government would introduce 10 days of paid sick leave for federally regulated workers. At a campaign event in Winnipeg this morning, Trudeau said no one should choose between staying safe and paying their bills. Within the first 100 days of a new mandate, a re-elected Liberal government will introduce 10-day paid sick leave for all federally regulated workers. Now, the Liberals had previously introduced three days of paid personal leave for federally regulated workers, Trudeau urging the provinces to introduce 10 days of sick leave as well. And producer Mike Richards has stepped down as host of Jeopardy after a report about past misogynistic comments surfaced this week. Richards was chosen last week to succeed Alex Trebek. His selection was seen as divisive, though, from the beginning. The show embarked on a broad search that included actors, sports figures, journalists, and celebrities. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns. On Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM. And 1310 AM. Let's talk about one of the hardest hit industries and how it's recovering. Cruise lines. The cruise ship industry. My good friend, longtime friend, uh, Elliot Finkelman is back. He's travel expert, owner of Elliot's Team Travel, a Diamond Expedia Cruises agency here in Ottawa. Good morning. Nice to share a mic with you again. Hey, uh, how are you, Elliot, these days? Um, we're doing we're doing well. Yeah. Um, you know, just uh, going along with what you just said, it's probably one of the only industries where we we can't even do takeout. We can't do curbside service. Um, 
our biggest frustrate a couple of frustrations but one of them is that uh you know uh we really can't sell too much we're not going to see revenue till january basically if things go as we're hoping they are going okay. um there's lots of people purchasing but for 2022 2023 wow so you know if you see a local travel agency they've really been struggling since the beginning of this um so when was the last time you saw revenue well we really you know uh we see drips and drabs here okay. uh, because there are some sailings going out there are some people traveling and in our case we sell more than just cruises that's the bulk of our business so we do see a little bit but hardly anything that uh, let's put it this way if it weren't for the government handouts right now uh we you would see half of the agencies even more gone there's been a lot of dropouts already yeah uh, the travel industry council of ontario tracks all of that and because we are a regulated industry and there's a lot of fallout already okay how have consumers attitudes changed uh, coming out the other side of this hopefully uh, assuming well, we're we, coming we, out the other side of this you know yeah we're yeah. getting a little bit of covid fatigue um from people uh, people really want to travel there's no question oh, yeah, They're just yeah, yeah. chomping at the bit we see great uptake again for next year and the year after what's what's getting them is a lot of people you know uh, if you go back to march 19 you know when this started oh yeah this will be over in june so they were booking a little farther out a little farther. and the key, we're doing a lot of booking and rebooking booking and rebooking um and and moving things forward that's that's uh, one problem the other issue we have um, is that the mixed vaccine message and you really have to if you're booking anything now you know make sure you're talking to a consultant because this is fluid it changes every two minutes it really does mm -hmm. our team has got to keep up with it all the time and you want to make sure that what you book is cancelable and movable and um, and that you understand the protocols because every country is slightly different every cruise line is different one good news about the cruise line industry is it's probably the most regulated in terms of when you get on that ship, you have to be double vaccinated. You have got to prove it. Um, they do testing. What about, but let, let me ask you this just on yeah. vaccines. What about, it, because it seems to me one of the big problems for Canadians is that yeah. so many have mixed and matched. I mean, millions and millions of Canadians, one dose of this, one dose of that. How, big, of a, how big of an obstacle is that for booking a cruise? So within that particular segment, again, if you're, I would suggest to anybody, if you're not looking to go until, you know, say March and beyond or, or even January and beyond, I would book something that's cancelable because the prices are going up. That we're seeing as okay. these ships are okay. filling. And there is huge demand. Remember, it's not just Canada. It's the whole world going at this. Uh, and they're all sailing at lower capacity. So um, it is a concern, and it depends what country. If you're going, for example, uh, to certain countries in Europe, it doesn't matter. So maybe that holiday to Greece on a cruise is a great time to do it. Uh, if you're going out of a port in the States, it can be an issue for you. So you really have to know each cruise line handles it differently, and each country, that's really the trick. Uh, there are a couple of great websites. One of them to start at is our own Canadian government one, travel.gc.ca. Okay, um, okay. But you need to know they all have different rules and regulations. Uh, ships must have 95% of the people double vaccinated. So we've seen sometimes where people are getting a notice, um, you know, before they're sailing saying, hey, we're at capacity, sorry. Um, you're not vaccinated, you can't come on the ship. We've already got our feel of that. So you have to be really, you know, number one, vaccinated. And we really do need the government to get, uh, get at, you know, uh, to the CDC and, and work out something with this double vaccine. Because it does, amongst that particular group, it, it, it's troublesome. It's worrisome. Okay, okay. Um, but prices are going up. You said, not, uh, would you say there are bargains to be found or yes, all, yes, yes. Yeah? If, if okay. you're, if you're willing to go last minute, there's some good bargains, Yeah. but the prime stuff, you know, the, the, the Christmas vacation time, the, um, uh, spring break time, you know, and all the traditional high times for, you know, given travel, depending on where you're going. Uh, yes, there are things like river cruises. They're reporting 90% sellout already for 2022. Wow. So, you know, there, but there are deals. It's like any shopping. A lot of, you know what, uh, we're getting a, a fair amount of Canadian travel. And there's some great deals if you want to fly, uh, you know, to Vancouver, out east, for example. Uh, so you have to, but you have to be really flexible. 
as long as you're flexible, some of these new airlines, Flair, uh, has got some great flights. Just be careful when you're pricing those that you do all the add-ons because the low-cost carrier, right, it, it, it's a la carte. Everything's a la carte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, would you like a pilot? Well, add 50 cents. <laughs> if you, you know, are you going to help us wash the windows? We'll take 10 cents off. You know, that thing. so just be very careful of that. And the other big thing for people to watch out for is most of our travel insurance doesn't cover COVID. Oh, really? Yes, you have to be very... I was surprised... Can you buy one, COVID insurance, though? You can buy some plans will cover it, but you have okay. to be very specific. I know my group plan, I was very surprised, and I made them give it to me in writing, covered me, but a lot of the standard, and it was the same company that you can also buy as an individual, but the individual coverage does not cover COVID. So be very, very cautious as to whether your plan covers that, because you know you don't want to have to get airlifted or you know get be on a ventilator somewhere and, uh, and not, not have it paid for, right? Yeah. But now, let me it, ask you, yeah. uh, on the ships themselves, Yes, I mean, there are some things that are just never going to be the same. Um, you know, cruise ships are so well known for, you know, the fabulous, you know, the like, fabulous like, food, the buffets and everything yeah, else. Like, yeah. all of that is not on anymore. Well, yes, think. no, no, no. There, we really? do, you know, um, okay. We have a little experience with this going back to norovirus, which was common on ships. It's common in the world. Uh, you know, people just don't report it that the school today had a, an outbreak of norovirus, that type of thing. And people don't realize what goes on in all inclusives because they're not tracked like that. You know, we don't know how many cases of COVID have been in all inclusives, but we know exactly how many have been on cruise ships. And remember, cruise ships have actually been out for a couple of months now. Hundreds of, well, I don't know, but hundreds, but tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of passengers have been out there. So they've got the experience with it. And they're doing testing. When you get on the ship, you have to be tested. They're doing the rapid antigen. Some cruise lines are doing mid, uh, mid-sailing mid testing. And when you leave, some of them are providing you that testing to come home with. Okay? So they know pretty much what's going on. When they do have incidences, they have got areas of the ship where they can quarantine the people, you know, their balcony rooms, not in the little lower rooms. And there's been very, very little of it. If you look at uh, the population that's been out sailing, very, very little incidents. It's fantastic, actually, how they've been able to do that. So take, for example, um, with norovirus, what you can do is in the first day or two of the ship, maybe the staff is going to feed you the buffet. Once the ship is cleared and you know that there's no incidences going on, then you can open it up a little bit more. So it will be that type of thing. The buffet will still be there with the choices, but perhaps you'll point and say, I would like that, and I would like this, and I would like that, and they will serve it to you and oh, maybe see. You okay. bring it over to your table. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's... Are they, you know, what that's, are you hearing from the operators? Are they having... Because some industries are uh, have labor shortages. Are they having a hard time finding people to work on the ships? Or um, are you, you hearing anything about no, that? Yeah. I haven't heard a lot from the cruise line saying that they're short there. Where they are short, you know, reservation agents, that type of uh, okay. um, work. But the people that work on ships are they need the jobs they want the jobs they've got to get back to their jobs uh so no they're quite eager uh, to come back and you know remember a lot of those crew come from parts of the world that uh boy they cherish these jobs they don't yeah. uh, they really need them so no they really haven't had a problem on that level again more the shore side um shortages and and the typical shortages uh you know maybe there won't be all the food choices because maybe tomatoes are short this week or uh, that type of thing. But in general, no, uh, we've had lots of friends that have been on ships already. I'm going shortly, actually. Oh, where are you going? Where are you going? I'm going, uh, I'm going to the Galapagos, believe it or not. Okay. Um, so looking forward to that experience. And, you know, you have to, uh, for example, when we're in keto, you cannot walk out without a mask. It doesn't matter where you're going. It's just that's going to change for a while, right? That's going to be the new reality. So, you know, if that's really going to bother you, then look and adapt and go somewhere else possibly. Uh, I remind people that staying in Ottawa in the middle of February uh, is your alternate. And, uh, you know, try and put that image in your head and, and maybe having to be a little inconvenienced when you travel isn't such a bad thing. Uh, we adapted after 9-11 to all the security and now we'll adapt to this, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, going forward. And I think things like rapid antigen tests and, and uh, uh, that type of thing. And I just wish the rest of the world was as great as our fellow Canadians yeah. in getting the jabs into the arm. So right? look, that I know, I know uh, Elliot, I know the rest of the year is going to be a challenge for you, but when people are booking, what's popular? 
Well, we're seeing a lot. Well, the Caribbean, of course, is always popular. We're seeing a lot of Europe. A lot of people want to, and a lot of, we're seeing, I'll tell you what we are seeing, a phenomenal amount of longer trips and bucket lists. A lot more bucket ah. list trips. Uh, like I say, like the Galapagos, that's a bucket list trip for me. Okay. And it was, you know what, we're doing this now because, you know, how many opportunities? Uh, Alaska is very, very big, very big for next year. Right, right, right. Uh, there's still room in Alaska this year, too. Okay. Uh, so Alaska is another great so one. So it's kind of like FOMO cruises, fear of missing out kind of thing. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. And a lot long people have got, um, you know, uh, we have lots of guests that travel two, three times a year. They haven't traveled for two years. There's a lot of bent, you know, uh, a lot of money sitting there. And they're going, you know what, let's go for two weeks this time or three weeks. Uh, world cruises, which, you know, uh, there's one, for example, starts 62000 U.S. dollars. Um, it's going to sell out in three days. <laughs> it's going to sell out in three days. Oh, and by the yeah. way, that's the 2023 <laughs> sailing. Wow. Holy yeah, cow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm right. booked, uh, that's the other thing for, uh, and I'm, I'm serious. We have guests. I've, I've got a group going to uh, Vietnam and uh, uh, Cambodia in 2023. Uh, it's a small ship of about 40 cabins. We basically sold the whole ship out. There's maybe three or four cabins left. So people are planning ahead because demand will, you know, they just know that that's, you know, the seasoned traveler knows that. So uh, if you're sitting on the sideline, just make sure you get a refundable deposit, and then it's a win-win for you. Um, you know, uh, book it, get the room you want, the trip you want, and then if it needs to be changed or adapted, you've got lots of time to do it, and there's no downside to it. So great to hear from you uh, this week. Well, thank you, and I appreciate it, and keep up the well, good fight. Hey, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon, Elliot, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It. Yeah, Elliot Finkelman, uh, Expedia Cruises. Ottawa, Canada, Westboro Parliament, back in just a moment, 11-18. Talk some sports, Red Blacks football, with Steve Warren from the Steve Warren Project. This is City News. It started out with a small outdoor booth in what was called Artist Alley, which is actually the area just outside our store on William Street. Uh, where for a couple of years we sold uh, our jewelry uh, directly on the street and then we slowly evolved to having an indoor uh, location in this building, 55 Barwood Market Square. We then moved to another location in Place de Ville and then moved back down here on Dalhousie Street at Eargear in the 90s and then back into this building again in, uh, in 2000 as a collection. I do a collection of jewelry called Cirque that's uh, mainly uh, beaded work with a combination of semi-precious and uh, vintage beads. And then she does a hat collection uh, called Fanfreluche, that's all cut and sewn hats in a variety of fabrics and for uh, all of the seasons of the year. We've curated and sourced the artisans that we represent in a lot of different ways over the years since it's been, you know, uh, since 1985. Uh, some people come to us since we're known and uh, other artisans that we represent might uh, recommend that they come and see us. Uh, some people we find at craft shows or we see uh, their work, somebody wears it in and we go and track it down and bring it. And then some people interestingly are with us in one medium and then sometimes they evolve to another. They're all Canadian and mainly local. Um, with the roughly 50 people that we have, I'd say more than half of those are Ottawa Gatineau and then the rest are from other uh, cities in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, um, Vancouver, etc. If you can afford it, go to a small business and spend some money. It's lovely when you come in and, you know, give me a pep talk and tell me how much you love this place and you've been coming here for years. But if you can afford it, please spend some money too, because all the pep talks in the world are not going to pay my rent, which is still full rent even when we're closed. Then secondly, if you can't afford to spend money, follow the businesses that you want to support on social media. Go to their Instagram, go to their Facebook, follow their Twitter, and then retweet. Uh, share their Facebook page, like and comment, 
because if you can't afford to, as many of us can right now, to do extra expenditures, doing all of those little things like that will raise the visibility of those small businesses and hopefully for them result in some online or curbside or other uh, business for them. The pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. In sports. Steve Warren is back from the Steve Warren Project and the Sense Nation podcast. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. CFL, Steve. CFL season is uh, well underway now. The Ottawa Red Blacks, for them, it was a bye week, but the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are off to a good start. They're 2-0. and The Ottawa Red Blacks are 1-0, and uh, and they will face each other in Saskatchewan tomorrow, 7 o'clock kickoff. Uh, what do you think of the Red Blacks this season? I'm surprised they won opening week, to be honest. Uh, the defense is not very. Or the the de- sorry, sorry, the offense is not very good so far this year. Uh, but it's just one game. Um, we don't know exactly what we've got here in the Red Blacks offense. But I mean, they were just even though they got the win, they were really, really bad. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it always takes a little longer for the defense to get going. I mean, offense creates and, and defense destroys. Like I think of your handyman skills, Rob. It's easier to wreck stuff in your garage. Oh yes, to create oh stuff, yes, right? yes, yes. I I could be Canada's worst handyman. That guy could be me. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the offense isn't going to be elite, um, but it's not going to be as putrid as it was in Week One. Uh, Matt Nichols is uh, Exhibit A because there's a guy that hasn't played in two years. Yeah. He injured his shoulder almost two years ago to the day, and not even any exhibition games. You fire him into a new offense, new personnel inexperienced offensive line and uh, it's going to take some time take some time so i'm guessing you're leaning rough riders then steve uh, if you were a betting man then eh? i would say so yeah they're uh, 10 and a half point favorites wow they okay. are at home and uh, there's just so much to work on for ottawa saskatchewan i mean they've got a great offense great defense uh, great special teams other than that they have nothing <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, they had two nice wins over BC and Hamilton to start the year. Yep. Uh, familiar name in William Powell in the backfield for the Green Riders. Another familiar name is Jason Moss, who's their offensive coordinator. Oh, yes. Was, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember him. That, yep. Yeah. He had that role here, of course. So, and, and they'll, they'll certainly have to watch a couple of absolute burners uh, in uh, receivers in Saskatchewan and Kyran Moore and Shaq Evans. Those are two guys that can every year go over 1,000 yards in reception. So Saskatchewan will be a very tough out for the Red Blacks. And, uh, yeah, if I have to pick, I'd be going Green Riders for this one. It'll be nice, though, to have games and fans back at TD Place, certainly for some CFL football. It's been way too long. And it's always um, it's a good time. You know, even when the team is awful, just going to the game is a good time. I've never had a bad time at a Red Blacks game. For sure, and then that's what the they've done a really good job since day one back in 2014, I guess it is now. They've made it just an event. It's, yeah, it's yeah. not just for football fans. You think back to the old Lansdowne with that lime green turf that was covered in bird crap, and yeah, they just, yeah, yeah. it was easy. the only reason to go was you're exclusively there because you're a hardcore football fan. Yeah. Now you see. People that are just you might might watch the game for ten minutes. It's as much a party as it is a football game, and then everybody you know for the last five minutes sort of goes, "Okay, well, let's see how they're going to do here at the end." Yeah, but it's yeah, it's a great yeah. environment. It's a great facility, and it's definitely going to be uh, great to see fans back Absolutely. at TD Place. Uh, I was just looking, just in preparation here, because. Um... I forgot all about it that the um, the British Women's Open is on, and uh, now I've just realized I'm going to have to watch. Um, I'll have to watch some women's golf this weekend, Steve, which is not a bad thing because Brooke is right there. She's right there in it. She's only uh, like three shots back. So this is a, this is a big deal. Yeah, there's a couple of things on that in that. Uh 
the open style, the the links. Oh yeah, horses. and it's at Carnoustie too. So I mean, it's yeah, like, that's yeah. Vandeveld's uh, that's the, the right. place where Vandeveld me- melted down on eighteen, I believe, in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, classic. Yeah. Oh, classic. absolutely. So, yeah. uh, but it, I mean, link style golf really hasn't agreed with Brooke Henderson. If you look at the women's majors, look at her stats. She is way off uh, when it comes to link style golf. Um, compared to the other three on more conventional courses. And so I'm a little surprised that yep. she's uh, figured things out at Carnoustie the way she has. It's so different. You obviously can't go pin hunting. Uh, you have to, you know, drop balls in front of the green and hope that you get the bounces as it rolls up. That just has, that style of golf just hasn't agreed with Brooke Henderson so far in her young career. But it's awesome to see that she's, uh, she's off to a very nice start. Uh, last I checked, she was tied for 12th. Yep, that's what I have her at right now. Uh, tied for 12th, she's uh, she's at 4 under. The leaders are at 7 under. So only 3 shots back. And you know, Carnoustie, you get into that rough, you get into one of those bunkers, 3 shots is nothing, Steve. It'd take us 9 shots to get out of one of those bunkers. So, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I might actually find a foot wedge or something like that. Uh, <laughs> All right, what's going on with the senator, Steve? There's doesn't see week after week goes by. I hear nothing. I hear nothing. What's happening, Steve? Tell me something is happening, please. Well, there hasn't been a ton. We had uh, they brought back uh, their tough guy from two years ago and Scott Sabrin this week. Uh, so it's uh, it's not a lot. It's certainly some a player that DJ Smith likes a lot. He had him in junior, kind of plucked him out of nowhere two years ago and brought him in to be the tough guy. He unfortunately had that awful incident where he kind of slammed into uh, David Backus of the Boston yes. Bruins and did a face plant. That was That's just an right. awful Very situation. Very scary, yeah. Very scary. Yeah. But, and, and everybody remembers the Austin Matthews kind of checking, who are you, on the back of his jersey. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think DJ Smith likes this player. They bring him back for another year. Uh, I don't think he'll play a ton, but I do think that uh, they're not really comfortable having Brady Kachuk do the fighting they kind of want him out on the ice and not in the penalty box for five minutes so if there's fighting to be done if there's a game or an opponent where they feel like tough stuff is coming down they've always got scott sabrin to call on but uh, yeah that's about you know in terms of recent news for the ottawa senators that's that's about it, it. sabrin yeah. is back that's the big <laughs> yeah. news. Okay. Well, there's still work to be done though Kachuk, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And logan brown phil yeah. gustafson let's get those guys let's up. get it on let's get on with it yeah, absolutely hey steve we'll talk to you next week thank you so much thanks robin yep. uh, congrats on time and uh, thank you so much thank you so much very kind of you steve warren from the steve warren project and the sends nation podcast available on all your podcasting platforms Coming up after the news, it's Queen's Park Week in Review. This is City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, the 20th of August. Good morning, I'm Chris Curries. Right now in Ottawa, partly cloudy skies, 27. Feels like 36, feels like 35, mainly sunny in Smith Falls. We've got a heat warning throughout the region. Here's what's making news this hour. The province reporting the highest number of COVID-19 cases in over two months, 650 new infections across Ontario. Of those, public health say 26 are in Ottawa, three in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, and one each in eastern Ontario and Renfrew County. The United States extending restrictions on the Canadian border for Canucks entering the U.S. for another month until September 21st. The Department of Homeland Security says the measures being kept in effect to reduce the spread of COVID-19, including the Delta variant. Canada's immigration minister says the department is ramping up processes to evacuate the families of interpreters and others who supported Canada's mission in Afghanistan. But at a campaign stop in Winnipeg this morning, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau would not say whether he would authorize Canadian soldiers to operate outside the Kabul airport to extract, pe- extract people safely to the airport. One man arrested in a single vehicle crash that seriously injured the passenger near Dow's Lake. A white sedan crashed on the QEW around 1.30 this morning. Police say the driver was arrested at the scene. The passenger, once critical, is now in stable condition. And that was quick. Just over a week after Mike Richards was named the new host of Jeopardy, he has stepped aside. Reports suggest there were too many scandals and that would be a distraction. So what now? There will be more rotating guest hosts until a permanent host is found. City News Time, 1132. I'm Chris Curries for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, the gang's all here and we have a lot of ground to cover between now and noon. So let's launch right into it. It's Queen's Park Week in Review. We have three MPPs on the line. Gilles Bisson, long time no talk with the Hello. Democrat uh, from Timmins. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, how are you doing? Are you in Timmins? I'm in Timmins. Uh, my wife has got me putting interlock in the backyard. Oh, okay. How's the weather? Oh, 32 degrees. It's beautiful. Love it. 32 degrees before the humidity? Uh, be 30, no, after the humidity. It'll after be a lot the humidity. Than that. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Boy, boy. Do you, do you, does it usually get that hot in Timmins? Uh, summers are pretty good here, yeah. so okay. winters are even colder. <laughs> yeah. do you, do you, and just one more question before I introduce everybody else. Yeah. What are you paying for gas? Uh, it's a dollar, uh, what is a dollar 44, I think. Oh, dollar 44. Yep. I got gas this morning. It was 136.9, 136.9. Oh. You and I are going to call for gas price regulation together. <laughs> no, we're never going to do that. We're no, we're never <laughs> yes, going to do that. Are. No, yes, we're we not. Are. No, we're never, we're never going to do that. Because I'm just back. I actually, I'm just back. Let me introduce everybody. John Fraser's here, Ottawa South. John. Good morning. Hi, John. How are you? Good. How are you? Where are you today? I'm uh, in Ottawa South, but old Ottawa South. Uh, old Ottawa on, South. On the, fancy fancy part, the fancy part. The fancy part. I have a lunch Ottawa with her. South. So later on. Okay. Good for you. Good for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, I don't know if Dave Smith has been part of this panel before. Progressive Conservative yeah. MPP Peterborough Quartha. Dave? Hi, Rob. This is the first time I've been on with first you. First time? Okay. Mm-hmm. First timer. Okay. Uh, rookie. Rookie. And Dave, where are you today? I'm in beautiful God's country, Peterborough. In Peterborough, Ontario. Okay. All right. Uh, what are you paying for gas there? It was one thirty three nine this morning. One thirty three nine. You can get it for one thirty three nine. You got to kind of go looking for it in Ottawa, but you can get it. You can mm-hmm. get it. John is good at that. He he goes out at night looking for cheap gas. So hey, uh, I, I I got premium at a dollar thirty two at uh, the corner of Walkley. <laughs> premium? premium premium for a dollar thirty two. Yeah. Jill, can you imagine? Oh, okay, yeah, they, they ran uh, <laughs> they they, uh, they ran out of regular. Oh, they ran out of regular. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's why. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into um, the big news here. Vaccination policies will be mandatory in some high-risk settings, but vaccines will not, okay? What is the position of each of your parties on these vaccine mandates, specifically for employees in healthcare and education? Gilles Besson. 
Well, it should be mandatory. Listen, uh, we see this week that the uh, Conservative government under Ford has said members of Parliament have to be vaccinated. Uh, Rick Nichols this morning ended up no longer a member of caucus because he refused to do so. So if there's a standard that's set for members, there should be the same standard uh, for the rest of workers in those critical areas. Uh, this this whole approach of saying, oh, that if you don't take a vaccine, you can get tested is problematic because a lot of school boards and a lot of hospitals don't have the wherewithal to be able to do the testing. For example, here in Timmins, our, our, our uh, rapid testing uh, uh, clinic no longer tests for the workplace. You have to go to North Bay or Sudbury to get it, which is three and four hours away. So this is really unpractical. It doesn't work. Our numbers are going up. Uh, so we say everybody in those critical areas should be vaccinated. If it's good enough for MPPs, should be good enough for the rest of us. Okay. John Fraser? Oh, mandatory vaccinations for frontline healthcare workers and education workers. Or, uh, bottom okay. line, bottom, it, the bottom line. All right. And, or, and or, it's, it's, or else what, John? Or else well, what? They, they, they shouldn't be working with vulnerable people. So the first thing really? you do is you, is you, is you educate. You know, you, they talk about the education sessions are important. I think the government has to do um, a very thorough education for people about um, about the risks, the risks to themselves, the risks to others. I think it should be clear to people uh, that, you know, you, if you do have a right to make a choice, you know, people who are being helped or served or taught, they have a right to a choice, too, to know that the person who's serving them has been vaccinated. Because it's Right now, the Delta variant is quite dangerous. Unvaccinated people are at a lot of risk. They provide they, There's a lot of risk for them to spread the disease. And it's not about, it's not about a stick. It's about creating a standard. I mean, oh, like, you know, but John. Said, you know, the, pre, the premier set a standard in his caucus, and he kicked somebody out. Yes, he kicked somebody so, out. He kicked somebody so, out. So, 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 so John, John, so, uh, John, but, John, let me yeah. in here. Let me in here yeah. before okay. we get to Dave here. Okay. Um, are you telling me that uh, a liberal government would actually, what, kick out a nurse? Kick no, out a teacher? The, the, the what, what you would do is you re- educate. Educate. You, re- you, you, edu- you teach people about you, you teach people about vaccines and the importance of it. And the second thing you do is you redeploy well, uh, people. You redeploy people to an area of less. Ah, uh, so you would accommodate them. You would accommodate well, you do your, them. You do your best to accommodate them. If you can't accommodate them, then it's time to re-educate, re-employ. You know, if you're re-educate. working in healthcare, right? You know, should you really be should, should you really be there if uh, if you pose a risk to yourself and somebody else? I mean, okay. This, you know, I think. Okay. Let's, here's let's, a, okay, one thing. This rub. It's a reasonable expectation for families to know and to want the person who's caring for their parents or teaching their do- yeah. son or and daughter. And John, I that's don't that's disagree with actually, anything you're yeah. saying. I'm just wondering how far you're willing to go. For example, Mr. Legault on the Ottawa, on the Quebec side of the Ottawa River is saying you have it until October 1st. And don't if you're not vaccinated by October 1st, you're going to be suspended without pay. Well, Chio just... Did the same? Chio just made uh, vaccines mandated vaccines. If you're a staff member, if you're a volunteer, if you're right, going into okay. the hospital, they just mandated. All right, Dave Online. Smith, like, PC MPP to. Peterborough. Uh, so obviously, your colleagues on the panel don't think you're going far enough, Dave. How do you how, how <laughs> well, do you really, respond to that? It's really interesting that you say that, Rob, because if, if you listen closely to what both of them said, they said it's mandatory. But if you don't do it, we're not going to do anything except talk about vaccine hesitation and we're going to follow all of the same things that the pcs are laying out in the vaccination policy that's exactly what they are they're advocating for the same thing that we're talking about where the chief medical officer of health the person who is the highest ranking medical official has come out with his medical opinion and for whatever reason a politician on the liberal side seems to think he knows more about medicine than the top doctor in the province does. oh my god but then they reiterate exactly the same thing that we have been talking about what we're fighting against is that vaccine hesitancy and premier ford has been very very clear If you're medically able to be vaccinated, get vaccinated. And that is what we have been saying all along. And the vaccination policy reinforces that. And it makes sure that we are looking after the health and safety of everybody in Ontario. That's what we're doing. That's what the vaccination policy does. And it's coming from the top medical official. 
in this province. It's not something that's cooked up in a, a back room with Stephen Del Duca and a couple of his buddies. Wow. Okay. Really? Okay. Re- really, Dave? All right, John, go ahead, John. You want in there. Dave, go ahead. Dave, yep. Dave, you know, look, Ontario's nurses, Ontario's doctors, Ontario's teachers are all calling for mandatory vaccinations. You guys aren't doing mandatory vaccinations. You're doing exactly what you said, which is like what you're, you're accusing us of, which is not what we said. You're saying what we are, what we are doing is we're making sure that we're fighting against that vaccine hesitation. And you're saying exactly the same thing in your policy, but you're not saying that in your language. You're misleading the population on this. And, and it really comes down to we all recognize that there is. A vaccine right, hesitation out there, and we right, have to right. get through that. Very quickly, Jill, go I ahead, Jill, because there are other things I do want to get into why here. Is okay. there, why is there a mandatory vaccination policy for the Tory caucus, but there's not for <laughs> nurses, teachers, and others? Why? why? Well, that, that's well, a good we question. Been, okay. What Premier Ford has said, and, and we stand Maybe by it's it. about setting an example. Medically, Maybe it's about setting an example. to be vaccinated yeah. and get vaccinated because we are the ones... But you have a mandatory vaccination there. policy for your own members. If it's good yeah. enough for MPPs <laughs> and politicians, why is it good enough, not good enough for those who work on the front line who could possibly spread yeah. the virus? Okay. Right on, Joe. <laughs> Dave? What, um, yes. Yeah, go ahead if you yeah. want to answer that. Go ahead, yep. Again, I, I come back to we have a vaccination policy that says everybody who is medically able to get vaccinated needs to get vaccinated. And here's the steps mm. that we're going to put in place to make sure that people in Ontario are safe. And that yeah. has come from the chief medical officer of, of health, the person who knows the most about the best. He's already done it for his caucus. Okay, can I, can I like, the can you know both sides the, of the same argument? Medicine. I, can I just can, just one question? Okay, what, like, very, so very, 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 there are other Rick, issues I have to get into, so go ahead. Rick All right, Nichols very quick. Is, uh, it's Rick Nichols can't be in the caucus room, but if Rick was a nurse, he could be at the bedside. Or if Rick was a teacher, he could be with a student. That's what you're saying, but he can't be in the Tory caucus. Come on. <laughs> You know, what we're saying is that as, as elected officials, we're held at a standard above, and we need to lead and show people that this is what right. we should be doing. Okay, so it's about setting an example. Okay, Ontario Public Service employees, the broader public service needs to be vaccinated against COVID-19 or undergo regular testing for the virus. What do you think about that as a policy, Jill Bisson? Well, again, I think it should be mandatory vaccination. You think it should be mandatory, like for all you know, 65,000 public employees? For everybody, Listen, I, I, th- I think the reality is, is that if we're ever going to get this thing behind us, we need to make sure that we actually have a policy in place that allows people to get vaccinated. There is if somebody has a medical reason that they can't be vaccinated, that's understandable sure. yeah. and that you can deal with that. Yeah. But you, you giving people the option to be anti-vaxxers is not the way that we're going to get through this. So I think what we're what we're needing to do is to do a policy that says, listen, uh, when it comes to vaccinations, especially in those key positions in hospitals, long term cares, uh, schools, et cetera, we need to. Right, have but a this is the entire public service vaccination. Entire public service will need to be vaccinated or undergo regular testing. John. Yeah, John? Well, that's, yeah, no, yeah, that's I, what they're I, doing I, now. Yeah. 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 No, I, look, if you look across the, you look the country, you look across the globe, that's what employers are doing. It's the responsible thing to do. We need to do it. We need to set a... It's not about a stick. It's about a standard. And we found a way to get through all of this by working with each other. But we need to set that standard. We need to say you need to be vaccinated. And if you're not going to be vaccinated, then if you're in a workplace, you have to be put in a position where you're uh, posing less risk to the people around you. And especially if you're teaching kids who aren't vaccinated or you're with vulnerable people in a hospital or long-term care home, you, you, you can't be there. It's that simple. You know, it just, it, okay. it's, you know, like there, there's no, there's no debate about that. Okay. That's so I, I want to talk be. about the entirety of the public service. All Ontario public service employees need to be vaccinated against COVID-19 or undergo regular testing for the virus. What's your opinion on that policy? Dave Smith. Uh, well, first off, I, I have to thank Gilles and, and John for uh, totally endorsing what our policy is on this, that <laughs> the Ontario Public Service needs oh. to be vaccinated. Oh. and that That's, it's I am a uniter of people, Dave. Dave. This is why people come on so this. Thank program. you so much for endorsing what we're, what we're doing on this. That is exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Kumbaya yeah. times are back. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right.
Kumbaya. Can we sing Kumbaya? Kumbaya. We may at yeah. the end of this. We may at the okay. end of this. Okay. You know, it inspired yeah. me. Okay. I remember, we used to smile. Yeah. All right. Continue, Dave. Sorry, we're kind of cutting you off. Dave. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, as you said, there's about 65,000 people who are part of the. Uh, the Ontario Public Service right now, and that's a lot of opportunity for the virus to be spread. We know that the way out of this pandemic is through vaccination. It's no different than with polio, with smallpox, and all the other viruses that we've basically eradicated through through vaccination. So putting in a policy like this, saying that the public service needs to be vaccinated, and if they're not vaccinated, there are safety measures that are going to be put in place to make sure they're safe and their co-workers are safe. Okay. That's what we're doing. Right. That's what? at the advice of the chief medical officer of health. Okay. When we come back, we got to talk about invoice gate. When we come back, this is the Rob Snow Show, Queen's Park Week in Review, City News. Well, we all loved our rock t-shirts growing up, right? It was our badge. Hey, we went to this concert. We knew that band inside out. So we, we kept doing that and kept promoting that. What's, what's sort of happening now is that audience is dying. <laughs> I always say the earth is flat. <laughs> so the 60s rockers are falling off the end of the earth. So you don't see as big a sales anymore because my audience is disappearing. What's sort of helping uh, to promote that history is the kids are buying vinyl. And luckily we have a vinyl shop in the neighborhood here, the uh, record center. So what's happening is I've seen kids come in with their dad. And the dad said, hey, do you have any Beatles shirts? Do you have any CBGB? Do you have any of this? I said, well, why? Uh, you know, he said, well, because my daughter's into it. She's wearing my T-shirt. So slowly it's coming back, right? The kids are, I think, getting fed up with the generic music that's out there. And they want to click into something that, first of all, links them to their parents, something that they uh, thoroughly enjoy now. And maybe they're passing it on to their grandkids. Pandemic has been a couple of things, definitely hard on everybody. So much uh, uh, messaging that's out there that people don't understand, stats that every day, Jesus Murphy, like I'm getting a headache just reading this stuff, right? So, so really it was just trying to understand where we were gonna go from there. The city of Ottawa all of a sudden said, everybody's gotta wear a mask. You gotta wear it on the bus. People were scrambling, okay, and I had, uh, the store next door had really big windows, so I just flooded the window with masks. Well, that was the, the activity that saved the business. Uh, people were coming in buying two, three, four masks at a time at 20 bucks a pop here. <laughs> but my masks were so different. They were the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Queen, all the pop culture. Everything else out there was medical masks. <laughs> And right, so people said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to show my rock and roll. So it became the new, the new T-shirt, as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I've done, I'm Hintonburg. I'm at now at one 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 four A Wellington Street, which is next door to the Fab Gear Store. And the reason I've changed names, I've rebranded the store, is because I was planning on retiring. And, and in December, I went, well, I'm not going to retire, but I've committed to changing what the store is about. So I came up with a new name, Fab Gears Rock Shop, where legends are dressed, <laughs> and essentially get that message out. I prefer if the shirt don't fit, you come in, you try another one on. People like to feel the fabrics with clothing. It's amazing, you all come in and go, oh, I love that, oh, can I try this? So that's the big difference. I'm not out to make a gazillion dollars. I stick the way I am, old school. I take cash, we take cards. Come on in and talk to the owner. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Part two, Queen's Park Week in Review. It's been a feisty one today. Uh, Gilles Bisson, NDP, MPP, Timmins, John Fraser, Liberal, Ottawa South, Dave Smith, PC, MPP, Peterborough, Kawartha. Okay, uh, the Ontario PC says it regrets sending fundraising letters that were labeled invoice, invoice. Um... Should that be the end of the story, John Fraser? Is that the end of the story? It's over now. I'll move on. No, I, I, I think uh, elections. Yeah, I, I think elections Ontario has to look into it. Like you know, like it, it just it's beyond belief that they would send out a letter like that and that they would do it in a pandemic. And now they say it's never going to happen again. The other day I heard that Doug Ford hit the roof 
that's what he was saying to somebody. Um, but you know, uh, it's, it's not over. And you know, you can't, every time something goes wrong, you make a mistake, you get your hand caught in the cookie jar, um, and you get angry and you hit the roof. It, it doesn't, you know, like that's just a sign of a, a bad manager. And, um, but at the, at the, at the core of this thing, like sending out an invoice to people saying you owe us money, that's what they said. And then it was an inadvertent mistake that no specific person takes responsibility for. Not the premier, not Tony Miele, not a staffer, nada, nobody. That, that's not acceptable. Not acceptable. Okay, Gilles Besson, what do you think, Gilles? Well, I, I think time to move on. Is it and I remember the Conservatives in opposition to the Liberals were going apoplectic when it came to the shenanigans that the Liberals were up to when it came to fundraising. Oh, so many shenanigans. Just, I mean, where yeah, would well, you, you even remember, begin? You oh, those gee, shows along gee. with John Yakubuski. Oh, man, oh, so, man, oh, man. Where would so we even begin? Like, there was going to be a new day in Ontario <laughs> once the Tories got to power, and that kind of thing wasn't going to happen again. Uh, so... The fact that the government actually said, yes, we were wrong and we withdraw it, I think that is a good step. It's a good step in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to give them credit for that. Yeah. Uh, but it does say that there is a problem systemic within the Tory party because that wasn't just an accident. That's a marketing scheme. And that's what that was intended to do was to try to raise money by getting people to think they owed the 300 bucks. All right. Okay. Yeah. Cash for access was my favorite liberal one. Uh, that, that's oh, yes. that's yeah. still a gold medal performance for me. But yeah. uh, it, it, anyway, it, it, you know, John, whatever. Um, that, that, those were the old <laughs> days. Those were the old days, John. Um, now it's you, Dave. It's your party. Okay. You, you, you guys were busted. It's not a good look for you guys here. Um, I mean, it looks like you're trying to swindle little old ladies for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. This was a mistake that was made. And uh, uh, as John pointed out, uh, it, it wasn't something that Tony Miele had done. This was a, a marketing firm that we had hired to do it. We yeah. have taken a look at what our process is, and we're going to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again because it shouldn't have happened. Uh, the, the letters that went out did say invoice on it. It did say that it was asking for a donation. Clearly, they were not what we would have done had we actually organized it ourselves on it. We went out to a third party to do it, as do all political parties, and this was a mistake that was made that's not going to happen again. All right. When we okay. found out about it, we acted on it immediately, and we made sure that this isn't going to happen again. All right. Well, okay. well I just want to say, New Democrats don't go outside to do fundraising. We do it ourselves. Yeah. But if we did go outside, and I'm sure we have at one time or other, mm -hmm. uh, you sign that off. There is the party president, there is the party secretary, there is the party leader. That kind of stuff mm -hmm. is signed off. So it wasn't a mistake. That was intentional. They got caught. As I say, I give them credit okay, because okay, they okay. withdrew it. All right, so all right. You're very, you're very generous. You're forgiving. It's very good. Let's move yeah, along. I'm very forgiving. Okay. Um, what do we get? 11.54 here. With. That leaves us three minutes, so about a minute each. As you know, the federal liberals have an insatiable appetite for even more power, and they have triggered a snap election. And we are now about a week into it. Uh, for each of you and the constituents in your own ridings. So, Dave Smith, you, you'll get to go first. You're there in Peterborough. Peterborough, Kawartha. Okay. What, what is Most at stake? The, What's a big issue in your riding, for example? Most of the comments that have come in is questioning why the province would have an election during the pandemic. And we've had to let people know that it's not the province that's doing that. We agree that the focus should be on... COVID-19. It should be on making sure that the fourth wave is not a big wave and get Ontario through this so that we can recover at the far end. That really is the biggest issues that, that are coming through in my riding. How do we support small business? How do we support individuals? How do we get Ontario back to what we once were so that we can be the economic driver of this country again? And predominantly the questions that are coming in are why have an election now? I, I think that there's a lot of people that have uh, election apathy on this, and I, I'm concerned about that. I'd like to think that people are engaged, but clearly what people are talking about and what they want is for us to focus on getting out of COVID, focus on reigniting the economy, and focus on making sure that families have everything that they need to survive. Okay. Uh, Gilles Besson in Timmins. Uh, what are you hearing about the snap election call in Timmins? 
Well, people are saying, listen, it's pretty clear that Mr. Trudeau is doing this for his own reasons. This is not about Canadians. This is not about how to better manage the country. This is about how do the Liberals try to get a majority. I think they might be surprised. Uh, oh, really? The sense okay. that I get uh, talking to my colleagues who are out door knocking across Ontario and same is here in Timmins. Uh, I think there's a change coming, and I'm not uh, convinced that there's going to be a majority government at the end of this particular cycle. I think more than likely we'll be back into minority government. I think the New Democrats will pick up some seats. It'll be interesting to see what the Tories do. Uh, but there's a malaise towards the Tories in Ontario, and I don't see them making big, big in, in, All right. Right. Okay. Uh, All right. in, the, in the province as a result of Mr. Ford. Minute or less, John, minute or less. What are we, okay. Why are we I having this election, look, John? You know, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, as Dave, you know, I can relate to what Dave's saying. It's because you, know, you go to the door and people talk to you about a provincial issue. And what I hear more often than not is people are concerned about schools, the return to school for their kids, especially those with kids under 12. It's about ventilation. It's about smaller class sizes. Ah. It's about. So the federal election is about Doug Ford then, John. No, no. I'm just saying that's what's on people's minds. Right. When okay. you go to the door, that's what they say to you. But if I were to give an issue that's um, constant and prevalent, uh, it's housing. Housing. In my writing. Yeah. So I think it's housing. Uh, I think that's an important issue uh, yeah. federally for a lot of people. And um, and that's one that's constantly there. But when I go okay. to a door, people want to talk about schools. All right. Uh, okay. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. Stay cool, everybody, for the weekend. It's going to be a hot one. Thank you. Right. Bye bye, Dave Smith in Peterborough, John Fraser in Ottawa, Gilles Bissant in Timmins. That's Queen's Park Week in Review. I'm Rob Snow back on Monday. Sam LaPrade after the news. This is City News. The Rob Snow Show. Weekdays 9 to noon on Rogers TV and City. to you by Ignite TV.